Uh, can I welcome everyone to the 14th meeting of 2014 of the Public Audit Committee. Um, with apologies from James Dornan and David Torrance is uh, substituting for James today. Um, the first item, oh sorry, can we agree to take items eight and nine in private? Great. Thank you. Um, our next item on the agenda is an overview of local government in Scotland 2014 and we have Douglas Sinclair who is the Chair of the Accounts Commission, Fraser McKinley, Director and Controller of Audit, and Gordon Smale, the Senior Manager of Audit Scotland. Uh, Bruce Crawford was uh, just reminiscing with me, uh, Douglas, uh, about days gone by in, in COSLA. Um, so, yeah, you know, wel wel welcome to the committee, and it's good to see you haven't lost either your interest or influence in, uh, in, uh, in the public sector. Um, can I invite you to make an, op uh, an introductory Thank you. Thank you, Convener. I've got a short opening statement. Um, the Accounts Commission welcomes this opportunity to discuss the challenges facing local government with the committee. Scotland's councils provide important services, but they do so against a background of reducing budgets, of an ageing population, and rising demands and expectations from the people they, s they serve. Our work shows that councils are coping well, but they face increasingly difficult choices about how to maximise the value they get from the money that's available. To help make those decisions, they need to make better and more consistent use of options appraisal, carefully looking at how services are delivered and thinking openly of how, how, how services might be delivered in future. They need to ask the question, what works best and can we prove it? Many of the messages in this year's report are not new. I think the fact they are similar simply serves to underline their continuing importance. In particular, can I emphasise two areas? Firstly, the fundamental importance of good governance, the foundation of a successful council, with officers and councillors working well together in a way which engenders the public's trust and confidence in the council. Bad governance, on the other hand, is dysfunctional, time-consuming and expensive. Secondly, the statutory duty of best value remains paramount. We believe strongly that councils which place best value, which means continuous improvement in all their functions, at the centre of all they do, are best placed to deal with change. So while we recognise that the current context is very challenging, the, co the Commission is looking for councils to raise their ambition to up the pace of improvement. And for our part, we're looking carefully at how the Commission can provide further support through its audit work of local government. Convener, my colleagues and I would be very happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much. I, I was interested in the comment which you made about councils are working well. Um, I, I suppose it, it depends on how you want to, to, to use words. Um, from what I can see uh, in, in my area and also talking to, to people across Scotland, uh, councils are working well given the circumstances uh, under which they are operating. I, and I suppose you could maybe also say councils are working as well as you, you could expect, given the very severe limitations in, on finance. The stories that we're hearing is, about, you know, that there are clear problems just now, but what is beginning to emerge are real fears about the next two years in particular. Can council services be sustained at the present level uh, with the current financial settlement? I think in terms of councils working well, it's worth making the point that all councils are balancing their budgets as they're required to do. That's not necessarily the case in England. There's certainly some evidence coming through that they're finding that hard to do. It's true to say that money is tight and they are under a lot of pressure. I mentioned the, the point about an ageing population which creates more demands. Uh, but I think there's, there's still the issue of maximising value from the money that they do spend, £120 billion pounds per year. And that's why we've stressed the importance of looking at option appraisal. To date, councils have largely balanced their budgets by two things, by reducing their workforce and by increasing charges. And we've said in the report that reducing your work, the workforce is not, it's not a long-term sustainable solution. You can't go on cutting the workforce. So they have to look to other ways of, of uh, balancing the budget. And that's why we've encouraged them to look to new ways of um, delivering services, to have an open mind. The IBIN principle, that's the way we've always done it, isn't, isn't the way forward. They need to look 
at options appraisal to consider other better ways of providing services at the same quality, at reduced cost, at, at better quality or, or reduced cost. That, that takes quite a, a mind shift in local government because loyalties run deep and change in the way that they do things is never easy for councils to do, but that's, that is the agenda that they have, to, they, they have to face up to. I'm not disputing the fact that in the next few years resources will get even tighter. I think that's even more an imperative to encourage them to look more critically at the money they spend and whether they can say to the public we're maximising every single public pound. Even if they do, as you suggest, could they sustain services at the present levels within the current financial well, I think that's, that's partly the issue of, of um, councils um, being much clearer about their priorities. One of the things that came through on our last report on Scotland's public finances, there's not a huge amount of evidence to show that councils are focusing their budgets on, on their priorities. It's a case of, in a sense, to some extent, rolling the budget forward from one year to another and making the necessary cuts to, to balance the budget. I think there's a tendency in local government too quickly to run to cuts without examining uh, is, is there a different way of providing that service at, at, lesser, at, lesser, at lesser cost. Um, I think there's a, a bit about councils also being clear about where do they think they can ask, um, provide a maximum value, other things that only the council believes it should be providing or other, other organisations other ways of delivering services that, that might, be, might prove more cost-effective. I think that's the kind of debate that we want to encourage councils to have. I've seen some evidence of councils starting to share services so that services are delivered across council boundaries, and that seems to be working uh, quite effectively. And indeed, it's not just councils. We've, we, you know, we've seen examples of um, services shared, for example, with the, the NHS uh, and, and with other agencies. Um, is it your view that, you know, given the size of this country with 32 councils, 32 chief execs, 32 bureaucracies, that at some point uh, there would need to be a reconfiguration of uh, the local government structure? I, I, think, I think I'll duck that question, Convener. I think that those are issues for government, not for the, the, the Commission. I'll go back to your point on, on shared services. I think there there, there isn't a huge amount of evidence, I think we say this in the report, that, that shared services, certainly on a big scale, have been particularly successful. There are only two examples, for example, on shared services on roads, stateside contracts, and now uh, the two airshare councils. I think, um, I think my sense is that councils have rushed to shared services without necessarily thinking of the steps before that. Uh, I remember uh, when I worked in local government, a consultant talking about what he called the three S's. And the first thing was to simplify the process. You think councils are different, but they all undertake the same functions. Let's take something like the payment of a, an invoice, right? The, the cost of paying an invoice varies enormously from one council to another. Why? You need to get, you need to get into that. That's part of the, the process of benchmarking. But if you, if you took two councils uh, which were similar and said, right, let's have a look at the cost of paying an invoice, what they want to do, first of all, is to simplify that process, right? and then standardise it between them. And you only share if there's a business case so to do. And I think, I think what councils need to do more, and I think that's one of the benefits of the solis Kozla benchmarking project, and no doubt in which you want to touch, is that they've now got the evidence to be able to drill down in family groups of council and, and consider why are our costs higher than a comparable council. That's, the, that, that's a big agenda. That's another opportunity to save money. Uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the public's benefits. So I think we would encourage councils to do, to more, to do more of the simplification and standardisation because there isn't a huge amount of evidence that shared services on a big scale have been successful. Indeed, there's been a huge amount of money spent on, on that. I think there's a, there's a, actually would be an interesting piece of work to quantify how much money has been spent on shared, service, uh, shared services initiatives that haven't come to fruition. Um, just a final question. Um, you talk about and their key priority for key priorities for councillors in 2014, understanding the changing context and the crucial role of councillors, and you talk about uh, keeping up to date through training and development. Um, are councillors clear enough in the separation of roles? Like, for example, um, it would be my understanding that, that councillors um, would set the policy agenda, um, they would set the priorities for the council, they make the decisions about how uh, budgets are spent. 
but would it be appropriate for councillors then to engage in telling officers, um, you know, when they come down um, the managerial level about which staff should be deployed in which locations? Um, you know, uh, is there a sufficient guidance on, or is it appropriate, firstly, for councillors to get involved in that type of thing? And is there sufficient guidance so that councillors understand their roles? No, I think the point we make in the introduction is that the role of the councillor is at the beginning and the end of the process, as you say, to set the priorities, to allow management to um, manage the council, to deliver the priorities of the council, and then to hold managers to account for their performance. So that's that's the issue. I think I think the issue is um, a, a big issue about training. Um, I think that there is a, 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 and we make the point in our own report, we're critical of councillors not taking up the training that's available. I think, I think we need to have a wider debate about the training of, of councillors. Why do I say that? Because um, most councils are pretty good at providing induction training when new councillors start, and then they provide a suite of training thereafter. But it's left very much to the discretion of the individual councillor as to whether he or she takes up that training. Is that, is that good enough? It means that you, you could become the chair of a committee without necessarily having the training to undertake that uh, job. Funny enough, I was speaking yesterday to uh, an ex-councillor who had been appointed the vice chair of an education committee, and I asked him what training he had had, and he said he was given absolutely none. And I think there's a democratic deficit in relation to that, because how can members hold officers to account successfully if they don't have the skills and the training to do it? Way back in 2006, the Scottish Local Authorities Remuneration Committee recommended that there should be a national job description for councillors. So that you could, you, and that would be accompanied by the skills required to do the job, different skills for different jobs, different skills for committee chair, a training needs analysis, and a personal development plan. Some councils do that, but it's left very much to uh, individual counts, councillors to decide what training they need. And I think that's a very subjective judgment. It's a very difficult judgment for them to make. I think the council, as a corporate body, needs to take a much better grip of that. And I think there needs to be a debate whether the training arrangements that we currently have are fit for purpose. I personally don't think they are. We're, well, talking, we're talking about a business costing £120 billion. Yeah, sure. yeah? It, 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 no, the, you really need well-trained councillors to do that, that kind of job. They're, they come with um, a, a huge amount of goodwill. They want to serve the constituents. They want to... Um, they want to deliver good public services, but we need to ensure they've got the skills to, to, to do their job. What happens if councillors um, engage inappropriately in what are managerial decisions? Well, I think that's inappropriate. Um, I think that causes confusion as to, as to respective roles uh, within, within the council. The chief executive is the head of the paid, paid service. You hold the chief, chief executive to account for the management of the council staff and their performance. You, you have to be clear about that. Otherwise, you end up into, into a council that becomes dis dysfunctional. You go back to the point of good governance, that people need to operate in clearly defined and well understood roles. Are there sanctions available if councillors behave inappropriately in, in that respect? Gordon? Um, I don't think so. I, th I think through the code, the code, the, yeah. the, the code of uh, uh, code, code, of code of conduct for councillors that uh, is, is in place and, and is um, policed by the, the Standards Commission. Mm. Um, that that had that has got specific references in it to this very issue, and uh, the point at which um, councils have to be careful about going on the, beyond that boundary. I have to say, of course, that in practice it can be quite a grey area. Uh, there's that trade-off between councillors understanding the business and being able to uh, you know, make decisions and scrutinise. Per excuse me, scrutinised performance. Um, but at the end of the day, it's very important, as uh, Mr Sinclair is saying there, to make sure that people understand their respective roles and responsibilities. But I would stress that it can be quite a grey area and uh, needs to be managed very carefully from both sides, from the councillor and from the officer point of view. I think that, just on an end of the line, that crucially depends on the quality of the relationship between the chief executive and the leader, so they understand the roles of the leader saying to his, the elected members, that's your job, this is the job of the Chief Executive. Okay, thank you for that. Tavish Scott? Can I just, thank you, Convener. Can I just continue that line of questioning? The, um, in your recommendations, Mr Sinclair, there isn't a specific uh, suggestion around the, the kind of training you've just described, no. which I took to be uh, a recommendation or an inference that uh, that needs to be done on a national scale, even in the sense of some guidance to councils. Do you think that 
is the case for, for the future? Well, I, I think what I was trying to say, I think, is that we, we need to have a debate as to whether the current training arrangements are fit for purpose and perhaps revisit the recommendation of the Scottish Local Authorities Remuneration Committee as to the, the pluses and minuses of having a national job description for a, 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 a councillor and how what training um, councillors need. There's nothing in the Code of Conduct, for example, about councillors' requirement to take up training. It is left to their individual discretion. I pose the question, I admit to making a mistake, I added £100 million to the local authorities' budget. It's £21 billion rather than £121 billion. That's a piece of wishful thinking. Um, but I think there is a debate about the skills that they need, not least because public services are becoming ever more complex. You know, it wasn't the, the days of the, the single council running everything. You now get alios, you now get health and social care partnerships, community planning partnerships, um, various trusts and outside bodies. It's becoming a much more complex business and different skills are required in, in different, in different organisations. We don't have job descriptions for MSPs. Some may be tempted to say we should, but... <laughs> Do you not think there would be some resistance in local government circles to um, those of us sitting in this room, for example, starting to lecture, particularly those of us who were former councillors in the past, of which a number of us have been, uh, to, and I recall you saying this to me privately some many years ago, uh, the danger of us starting to lecture from this place mm. to local government about what they need to have in order to do their job properly? Yeah. They yeah. might say the same of you lot. They might. In angels fear to tread. Yes, um, exactly. I, I, all I think I'm saying as a personal view is not a commission's view. I think, it, I think that there, there needs to be a debate as to whether the present arrangements are fit for purpose. Thank you for that. Can I ask, uh, Convener, on community planning? At 112, paragraph 112, uh, the report says community planning is at a crossroads. I took that to be quite a significant statement. Um, and it, uh, again, I, is the Commission concerned about genuinely where this is going? I think we all have some deep concerns that community planning, which we have talked about for a long time, um, has yet to really deliver in a way in which we t would show substantial change to local government? Well, uh, it's fair to say, I mean, community planning has been around for a long time. The Act was 2003, and to some extent, um, the, the spirit was willing between 2003 and 2012, but the execution wasn't desperately good. And to some extent, there was a bit of treading water. The joint statement of ambition between the, the government and uh, COSLA has given an added spur to community planning. As you know, we did a, f a first round of three audits and we are well through the um, next round of five audits with two more to report back to the Commission. And then, along with the Auditor General, we'll take stock uh, and, um, and uh, make an overview report in, in terms of, of, um, of what we found. I don't want to prejudge that, but I think it's, it's fair to say uh, we found lots of examples of very good partnership working. I think it's important to capture that partnership working. What we didn't find was necessarily an attribution between that partnership working and the community planning partnership. There's a lot of good stuff on the ground. Uh, and I, I think it is important to, cap to capture that and to share it uh, across the 32 councils so they can learn from each other. I think we also found that the community planning partnerships were clear, those who were most clear about where they could add most value, with a focused number of priorities, were more likely to succeed than those who had, um, had didn't have that sense of clarity of, of, uh, of, of purpose and values. But we also found that areas like um, scrutiny and performance management, and the and the use of resources, are a long way a long way to go. In that assessment: Have you looked to an extent at uh, the merging of? of care for the elder, or just care and, and uh, social, social care department. Social care partnership. Yeah. Well, um, not yet. We, the the Council Commission has been given the responsibility to audit the co incorporated bodies from April, April of next year. Uh, we're not quite sure the extent of that audit. The regulations are still going through Parliament. They have been defined as local government bodies. And as you know, the duty of best value applies to local government bodies. We're not yet clear as to whether the duty of best value would apply to the incorporated bodies of health and social care. The Commission is trying to get itself up to scratch in relation to that. We had a, a very useful session last week with the Highland Council and NHS Highland to find out why they went down the road of lead agency. And we intend to have discussions with other councils and health boards who have chosen the incorporated body to learn from that. So it's work in progress. And just on this final point, the, um, uh, again at 112, the, the Commission's report rightly says that um, community planning, and I paraphrase, uh, will only happen if sustained leadership is significantly stronger than we have seen to date. Does that um, jar slightly with what I think are very fair findings about the political short-termism of so much of what's going on at the moment? It's, that's just the nature of the, of the beast that is local government at the moment in the current context. But, I mean, it strikes me as difficult to achieve 
exactly what you're saying there, sustained leadership, while at the same time there's so many short-term pressures. Well, that's my colleagues have wish to add to that. I think that's a very fair point. I mean, community planning, um, by definition, is a is, is a long term is a long term game. I mean, to make major inroads in inequality, you, you're you're talking about uh, you work over a generation, if if not more than one. And there is no doubt that um, that um, the changes in leadership um, in in uh, in councils kind of an impact on that. But that's equally true of councils. I think we're more and more convinced uh, in the audits, the best value audits we do of councils, the importance of an ingrained culture of continuous improvement that can withstand changes in leadership, be it officer level, chief, be the chief, chief executive, or be it the leader. And to try and I think we're wanting to define more clearly what are the ingredients of, continu of, a, of a culture of continuous improvement that we would we'd want all councils. And again, we come back to the issue of training both officers and members to make sure that's embedded and can withstand change. And if you can do that in a council, then hopefully you can transfer that to the community planning partnership. Uh, can I have one final question, convener, if I may? Thank you. Um, and that's on uh, the section you've got on procurement. In particular, it's at 59, paragraph 59, um, the Commission plan to publish a report on procurement at all. Government. Just a factual question. Do you plan to look at hub cores? and that structure, because certainly I have had lots of representations from local government about what that is, so without getting into how it operates and so on and so forth, strikes me as now a fundamentally important part of local government procurement, and it certainly needs some scrutiny. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so the procurement <coughs> report didn't look at that, Mr Scott, but certainly hub calls and indeed the role of the Scottish Futures Trust more widely is something that's very firmly on our radar. We'll be taking proposals to the Accounts Commission in order to general in the autumn of this year for the programme of work starting 2015 and beyond, so um, we will be, we'll be building that into the consideration there. So no commitment yet, but that whole that whole process and that whole um, way of now funding uh, capital projects is something that we are very interested in. Thank you. Hey, Colin Beatty. Thank you. Um, just to sort of continue on that theme with a little twist, repeatedly throughout this report, there's reference to leadership and often the inadequacies of leadership, and it's repeated again and again and again. Um, it's unclear sometimes whether you're talking about lack of leadership in terms of the officers or in terms of the members. And we've talked about training, but we're talking about training more on a functional basis, for example, skilling somebody to be able to chair a committee or, or, uh, or, or similar. Now, leadership is much more difficult to train somebody in, and I just wonder how that can be addressed, um, and I'm going to assume, and maybe you can confirm that, that we're talking about leadership of the council as a, as a body, as opposed to the members or the officers. No, you're absolutely right. It's, it's the corporate leadership provided both by the politicians and by the officer cadre as well. I think you're right. There, there is a bit about what you call functional skills, understanding budgets, being able to challenge officers, having those kind of skills. It's also about behaviours. I think that's really important as well, uh, the, the way that, that um, if you take, for example, um, leadership in community planning, the leadership role lies with the council, but that's not about dictation, that's a leadership style which is about fa facilitation, that's, a, that's something that people need to learn to do, so I think behaviours are just as important as, as, um, as, as, as knowledge. I mean, it's easy to give somebody technical skills. Yeah. But, again, I come back to the fact, repeatedly you're talking about leadership here, leadership skills. How do we, get the, how do we train people in that? Leadership is much more difficult to train somebody in. A lot of people would say you've either got it or you don't. But you can give somebody all the tools and hopefully they would respond to that. Let me ponder on that, ask Fraser and Gordon if they want to come in. I'll give you a chance to ponder, Chair. Um, so I think leadership development is key to this, uh, Mr Beattie, and what's really interesting is that we have seen, if you, if you look at the officers for a second, we have seen a big change in the senior officer, uh, particularly chief exec level, but very often knock-on effects there because a lot of them are, vast majority these days, tend to be internal appointments. So there's there's been quite a lot of churn, and, and from what we know and what we can gather, there's likely to be even more of that as we get towards the end of this year. So, so I do think there is something for the local government community to think about in terms of leadership development. The public sector in the past has had to go at some of this stuff. Yeah. There was the Scottish Leadership Foundation that was yeah. set up, you'll remember, some time back. Okay. Um, so, so I think, again, that, that we, we have experience as a public sector of leadership development, and it feels... So I think your question is, is, is very timely, and I think that would be a, a helpful thing for 
probably not just local government, but um, but more widely to think about exactly, as you say, the leadership development activity, uh, as well as the kind of technical and more functional training and development. You see that being left internally to individual councils to develop. Is it something for COSLA to try and uh, get some sort of uniform approach, or is it something, God forbid, it should be imposed by the government? So I don't, I don't suppose I would be encouraging any imposition by anyone. But and and to be fair, there is uh, quite a lot of activity and development activity now um, through the leadership forum, which is basically all chief execs from all parts of the public sector. They meet every year, uh, and there's activity that goes on there. That's not what you'd maybe characterise yeah. as as formal leadership development in that sense. But it is a sense I think that. Uh, over the last few years, the leadership of the public sector and public services in Scotland is probably as kind of cohesive as, as I can remember it. But that's a slightly different thing, particularly, as I say, when, when there is going to be churn, there is going to be more new people coming into those senior jobs. And so my, my sense is it would make sense to have that conversation, not just 32 times at individual councils, but a, a, wider, a wider conversation there about what, what does being a chief executive of a 21st century mm. council look like now? There's maybe a bit in there about whether we do have enough resource in Scotland to do this. Fraser mentioned uh, the Scottish Leadership Development Foundation, which no longer exists. I can remember the Scottish Local Authority Management Centre in Strathclyde, which provided high-quality leadership development to aspiring chief executives, aspiring leaders. And there may be, as part of looking at training in the round, we need to look as to whether there is enough resource capacity to deliver the kind of leaders of the future that you're talking about. Just to move on to something else. Alios, um, there's been discussion previously with, with Audit Scotland in connection with the auditing of Alios because, of course, there's a great deal of public funds go into that. It's never been quite clear as to how we're going to approach you know, following the public pound and all these good things in terms of Alios because structurally they are, they are a separate uh, organisation and yet it's public money going in there, never increasing amount of public money. How are we going to deal with this? Well... October, I think, of last year, uh, the, the Commission <coughs> commissioned a report from Audit Scotland, which will come back to us in, I think, autumn time this year. And we've asked the, the, the Commission for a comprehensive report on alios, um, because we understand the public interest in them. We want to know the number of alios, their size, their turnover, their status and form, and they take different forms, as you, as you alluded to. Some are trusts, some are, are charities, some are companies. Um, the rationale for setting them up, why did the council set them up? Was it to simply save money or was it to improve services in a way that uh, out, with, out with the council? Or was it a mixture of those? Uh, the representation elected members on Alios um, and if they are on Alios, uh, what role do they play? The scrutiny, of, the scrutiny of Alios by the council, because you're absolutely right, it's still public money and the council is still responsible for the public money and the quality of the service provided by the Alios. We want to look at governance, we want to look at, at, at performance. Um, and once we've had that report, I think the Commission will then decide what further work we would uh, ask Audit Scotland to do. So that report's anticipated in, 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 in autumn, autumn of this year? Of this year. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, look yep. forward to that one. We're, we're, we've, we've asked um, on the Commission's behalf all the auditors of the 32 councils to carry out that bit of work to understand, because I think part of, the, part of the thing we've grappled with in the past is just trying to get to grips with the number and scale and... Uh, and, and the size of the issue in terms of values. So the auditors are at the moment, as part of this year's audit, gathering all of that information and data. That will come into us centrally and we'll take a report to the Commission, which may well in, inform, I have to say, inform work not just in local government, but as this committee knows, um, there are other alios yeah. uh, in other parts of the world. You've, you've taken a lot of interest in uh, colleges and the New Arms Line Foundations, for example, uh, and there are other examples in health. So it's, it's more um, prominent in councils, particularly because the councils' alios tend to deliver services in a way that other alios in other parts of the world don't really tend to deliver services directly. Um, but, but we're hoping that this work that we're doing on behalf of the Commission may well have wider application as well. Just to move on, uh, on page 27, uh, paragraph 97, there's a first reference to cashback reserves. And on page 28, paragraph 105, uh, there's mention that uh, indebtedness has increased by 45 per cent. It doesn't mean, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense running up debt if you're going to have all these reserves. Do you have any comment on that? 
Yes, I'll, I'll take that one on. Yeah. The, the reference we've been monitoring reserves, the Commission's had an interest in council reserves for a long time, and this report has been monitoring the position over, over a long period of time. And you're absolutely right to make the connections between the position on reserves. And in fact, we were here a fortnight ago talking about Scotland's public finances and the need for long term financial planning. The point I'd like to make is that uh, you've got to look at all these things. All these things are the components that may be fed into a long-term financial plan, the level of reserves, what you're going to do with them, how much is actually free as well in that sense of not allocated to you know, particular uh, issues for the future. Um, so I think it's about looking at everything in the round, uh, very much encouraging a longer-term approach to financial planning that looks across these individual components. Um, on the reserves, if I could just say one of the things we're very keen to do is to make sure that councils have a clear statement about what they're going to do reserves. Why, why have they got them and what are they going to do with them? Because there are substantial amounts of money in, the, in, 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 in overall terms in reserves at the moment, although, as I say, the amount that's free and you know, for contingency is relatively small within that. So that's the position of reserves. Also worth mentioning that the Commission is uh, doing some work in uh, treasury management and uh, borrowing at the moment, which we'll be bringing a report. Um, I think it's due for publication in December this year. So we're looking at that component as well, just to, to cover both sides. One last point. Um, on page 12, paragraph 26, uh, there's reference made it will be sometime before the full impact of welfare reform is clear. And yet in the same paragraph, you also say that uh, uh, welfare reform will take something like 1.6 billion out of the Scottish economy each year. I mean, that's a huge amount of money. It must have a massive impact. I mean, this is separate from the, the budget cuts that are coming down from, from Westminster, which are obviously affecting the Scottish Government and by knock-on uh, reducing the size of the cake for local government. This $1.6 is huge. I, th and I think it's just part of that context. That the, the figure, of course, comes from a, a committee of the Parliament that's been looking at this. And it, in, in painting that context at the start of the report, it's a... You know, it's obviously a very important and, as you say, a very large number and something that we need to flag and, uh, mm. as part of that overall context for local government. Is, is, it, uh, is it an area that, in relation to local government and your audits of local government that you're looking at, the impact of these uh, cuts? Because you know, it's bound to have a knock-on effect yeah. in yeah. terms of... You've already yeah. highlighted that councils at higher levels of deprivation are likely to be hardest hit. So, and you're also saying that there'll be a substantial impact on local economies. That's got to have a, a knock-on effect on councils and the, their ability to, to generate services and so on to the public. It's bound yeah, to. So it's, very, it's, very changing. it's about the ability to deliver services. It's about long-term financial planning. But there's lots of uh, associated issues around about that in terms of what that means for local people in terms of the services they need, the advice they need to deal with a different... Uh, financial context within households, so that there's a whole range of issues that are encompassed this, which have a very, as you say, a very direct impact on a whole number of aspects of local government. I mean, that particular area is almost worth an audit in itself. Well, yeah. I was just going to say, Mr Beattie, that welfare reform is absolutely, again, mm. one of the key things that we're keeping an eye on in terms of our programme development work. We did, we did a piece of work for the Commission, I think, now last year, where we uh, undertook a, a fairly yeah. brief, um, but... Uh, but good study in terms of council's preparedness and to be honest we've been of the view that we really just need to let councils concentrate on preparing for the welfare reforms and that's been the activity up until now i think as we go into the next year we will begin to see more fully the impact locally um, and what that means for council services and local communities and that and welfare reform and its impact will again be one of the discussions we'll be having with the commission or to general when it comes to thinking about our forward work program absolutely just on that point. Uh, just to pick up on that point, thanks on the uh, level of indebtedness that, that was reported there and mentioned by Colin. Um, isn't it the case that the big increase in that is more down to the prudential borrowing code and the flexibility that that gives the councils? And I, I see that as a positive move uh, since that was introduced and it allows them to plan better, wiser and so on for the future. So despite the alarming figure of it going up 45%, isn't it a reflection of how well they're using the potential code to, to deliver their services? Indebtedness figure is, is, is made up of a number of things. What we wanted to do was give that sense of the overall uh, exposure, liability, whichever, whichever we would like to do. So it includes uh, external borrowing, but it also includes the liabilities that are built up through PPP and PFI 
and it becomes net because there are some elements of investment in there that bring that figure down a bit. But it, it is a large figure. You're right, it's been done in the context of the application of the Prudential Code that, that, uh, that, that oversees this. And that's very much the focus of the piece of work I mentioned earlier that you'll see a report on, or the Commission will be reporting on later this year. So uh, absolutely central to what we're looking at. We want to get underneath that because there's wide variation across councils within that overall figure. Can I ask um, about the alios? Um, and you mentioned you're going to be doing some work on that. This committee has looked at that issue um, previously, and I suspect that it's something that we would want to return to. One of the things that has concerned us is that there's not always a clear understanding um, from uh, with those who are on the alios uh, when, when it comes to governance. Um, you know, do councillors understand that when they are appointed to an alio, their legal responsibility is to the board of that alio and not to the council that appoints them? And you know, do you have any concerns? Because I've certainly seen examples of councillors trying to have the council interfere in the work of values to politicise it. Now, is it appropriate for councillors to demand that the councils that have set the alios up um, take certain courses of action if they don't like the decision of the alio? Um, should councillors be involved in, in that type of um, argument and debate out with the board of the alios? Those are the, the points you raise are some of the kind of things that we expect to come back from the auditors in, in the report that will come to the, the Commission. And it also touches the point on training. You're absolutely right that once you're appointed to the ALIO, your responsibility is to further the interests of the ALIO. I think related to that, and if we can separate the roles, it's, we also need to look at the, at the effectiveness of the Council as a, as a body scrutinising the performance of the ALIOs as opposed to just allowing the alio to drift off and not scrutinise its performance. You're, you're right, there can be conflict of interest issues for uh, councillors on the alio, but they need to, they need, again, they need the training to understand where that conflict of interest arises and to, to, do, to do the proper thing and, if necessary, to seek advice as to what they should do. Once the alio has been established, does the council which established the alios have any residual um, ability to interfere or influence the decision-making process of that alio? If, if the alio was going belly up, for example, the, the council has a responsibility in terms of following the public pound, public money that is invested in the, in the alio, the quality of service being provided, for example, there's a service failure by the alios, and there has been one or two examples of that, then the council has indeed has, has the has not only the right, it has the duty to, to no, interfere in, in terms to of that. the day-to-day the, no, the no, -day management day -day. decisions. No, no, they no. shouldn't be involved. No, they shouldn't be involved. No. We, right. We've published two, um, or the Commission published, uh, in fact, the first two reports in the How Councils Work series yeah. convener were about roles and working relationships, which, which touched on this issue, recognising that councillors are have that dual role sometimes, and then a specific one on arm's length external organisations, are you getting it right, we called it, which which looked in more depth that if you are setting them up, how do you want, how should you do that, and then how should you run them, and, and again, we touched on it in there. We're thinking the Commission are probably going to ask us to revisit that roles and relationships one again, not just in terms of values, but the conversation we had earlier about the complex role of, a, of, a, of an elected member. So again, I think we can touch on that there, but but just to concur with what uh, Douglas said there about um, the council still absolutely has a duty in terms of its governance and oversight of particularly the money that's giving to the ALIO, but as an independent charity company, whatever it is, clearly that board has responsibility for taking those decisions, and it is inherently complex. Thank you. Just a postscript on that. Um, Gordon's just reminded me, paragraph 57, the Caithness Heat and Power is a very good example of roles not being clear of bad governance or weak governance um, of you know setting up an alio without without uh, equipping the alio with the necessary skills to undertake its job properly you thank you for that mary scanlon uh, my first question was uh, really in the back of colin beachy uh, page 
uh, sorry, paragraph 26, the 1.6 billion that was mentioned, um, can you confirm that that was not a figure that was arrived at through Audit Scotland or the Accounts Commission, but it was a figure that was taken from a report from the Welfare Committee of the Scottish Parliament? Could you confirm that? Yeah. Uh, and can I just go back to the behaviours and training? Uh, yesterday in the Education Committee, we were looking at the Accounts Commission report on uh, schools and, and the, the various things, but mainly focusing on attainment, which uh, is an incredible issue. But as Fraser will know, uh, one of the, uh, I, I suppose, quite surprising uh, conclusions. I'm sorry I can't quote from it. I didn't bring it with me today. But it was uh, your conclusion that councillors rarely challenged officials. And uh, that, you know, it's... I, I think as far as this parliament, we don't want to be telling councillors what to do. But there was... I don't want to use my words. I'd rather use yours. <coughs> but you implied that uh, <coughs> councillors were not always fully informed about issues relating to attainment and uh, what they could be done in terms of uh, uh, you know, reducing the attainment gap. Um, so when it comes to training, um, is that something, something that you find, I think the word mushroom syndrome comes to mind, councillors being kept in the dark by officials in order that they, you know, they, come to, uh, they come to the conclusion that the officials want, and perhaps that some of the officials don't really want awkward councillors asking awkward questions. Uh, am I right? That was in the report, but I think it was more diplomatically put than I've just done. <laughs> I, I, th I think democracy needs awkward councillors. Um, I think what we tried to highlight in, in that report was the, uh, the fact that inevitably parts of education are national cur curriculum for excellence. But the delivery of education, the accountability for uh, education at local level lies with elected councils. And it's important that they undertake that, uh, that job. They need to get the information. They need to be setting targets to say, well, if our attainment isn't as good as a comparable council, what are we doing about it? And if they're not getting the information, they're absolutely entitled to be robustly asking the officials for that information. That's part of the councillor's job. Comments. Is it your conclusion that all councillors are not getting sufficient information to make the decisions that that we want in terms of attainment of pupils? I don't know if we, if, if we had sufficient evidence to say that. I think what we're setting out very clearly the, the important role, the key role, um, that the public and parents rely on councillors to ensure that the local delivery of education is as good as it possibly can that they are setting targets. They are benchmarking. Also, they need to benchmark the performance of their schools with comparable schools. One of the things we did find is that the gap between the best performing schools in one council area and another is actually, in, I think, a fair number of councils, probably almost half of the councils, actually, the gap is getting bigger. Mm. Now, councils need to be on top of that and to say, what are we doing about that? They need to challenge officers to make sure that the attainment performance is improving. Okay. So, sorry, uh, sorry. Can, can I ask you um, about that? Because I, I, I think to some extent there's a superficial argument often applies there. You know, if you talk about best attaining schools, you know, I, I could look at my my own constituents, and it depends what what your your yardstick is. I, you know, I, I have many parents who send their uh, their children to Grave High, which is one of the best performing schools in Scotland. If you look at exam results. And just a few miles along the road, we have Linwood High, where the exam results are not so good. But that actually doesn't measure the, the quality or the effectiveness of those two schools or the teaching staff, because there are other factors such as deprivation, parental support, the ability and resources of, of parents to bring in tutors to support their children. There are all sorts of issues. And, and I, I think it would be dreadful if we, we said that, you know, you, you have within the one area, you know, schools of high attainment and schools of low attainment and the ones of low attainment need to look at the high attainment because it's not as easy as that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting for one minute it, it is easy. It's very complex. I think what we did find in the report that the councils that had made the most improvement had done four things. They'd invested in the quality of leadership in the schools, they'd invested in the quality of their teaching staff, they'd um, invested in improving the relationships with parents and parents' involvement in, in, in schools, and they'd also 
introduce systems of tracking uh, and monitoring the development of um, and, and attainment of individual pupils. You're also, I think it's also right to make the point that the Commissioner's report stressed also the importance of achievement as well and the need for indicators for achievement as well as attainment. Tony Mary. So, um, I, I'm still on uh, behaviours and training. <laughs> this is my final question. Um, really, in your key messages, uh, I suppose paragraph 6 and also paragraph 74, um, you particularly talk about uh, there needs to be a balance between councillors' council responsibilities and their wider political activities. And I think in terms of paragraph 74, I'm not pointing a finger at any political party, but you do mention Aberdeen, and I think all of us, from the little I know, I know that uh, there are issues uh, there. But you do mention something, uh, that it's affected uh, decision-making, um, you know, is that uh, you also see behaviour in the council chamber regularly disrespectful, necessary for councillors to be reminded of their requirements and, uh, you know, various things. A, has this affected good decision making? And B, is it something that could be remedied or at least uh, helped, ameliorated by training? Um, because it, it would be a sad day, given the challenges of councils, that you know they were that, that political tensions were affecting wider decision making. I may just take your second point. Yeah, uh, first, I think yes, it can be ameliorated by training. I think it's the councillors' understanding of the code of conduct, which um, says they have a duty. I'll just quote from this: a duty to maintain and strengthen public trust and confidence in the integrity of the council and councillors in conducting public business. That's part of their duty. It's also part of their best value uh, duty uh, that they, they have to um, honour the trust given to them uh, by the electorate through uh, property and propriety. And uh, we all accept that um, uh, political tensions and differences are part of the DNA of local government. That's, that's what local government is about. It's an issue of when they're taken to an extreme when the only news coming out of the council is about squabbles, it's not about services, it's about fighting, it's not about frontline services. It's a question of extreme. And if it's taken to that extreme, the danger is that the, 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 the council is not demonstrating good governance or good leadership. And it's the Commission's duty to point that out. I note it is one of your key messages. Right, I'll just move on to my final question, and that is... Um, when, in your opening uh, remarks, Mr Sinclair, you mentioned uh, the financial challenges, and that's not new. And you mentioned the ageing population, and uh, that's not new. I've got a lot more grey hair than I had 15 years ago. But, uh, you know, what you mentioned is, uh, isn't new. But it's also, you, you said, you know, cutting staff is not sustainable in the longer term. But are the legal obligations of councils... Uh, many of them brought forward by this Parliament, sustainable in the long term. And I would just give you examples of uh, free personal care for the elderly, because I know the lead agency in the Highland, it, it is different. But I know that uh, th there are difficulties there, providing respite care, home care, etc. So, you know, is, is there enough... Uh, uh, negotiating, balancing or understanding between passing laws in this parliament and placing legal, legal obligations on councils and funding them sufficiently uh, to, to carry out these legal obligations. These, these are really issues for, for government and, and for bodies representing, COSLA representing local government when new bills come forward that COSLA will make the case to say the resource implications of this are X and they hope that the government will provide X in, in the settlement to make that to make that um, to make to make it to make the thing work. So you know, local government has to live with the consequences of, of government of government legislation. But I, I do understand the point that about the challenges. Yeah, These they, are they, they the are, major are big, challenges. Big, big challenges. Aging, the aging population, elderly people's needs are more, are more expensive than people who are not elderly. By There's definition, no ring fencing, <laughs> which we all agree with. Then the legal obligations and priorities have to come first. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, Bruce Crawford. Thanks, Convener. I just want to have a look at a couple of areas. Convener, maximising resources, reserves and assets, and also learning from experience elsewhere. Um, but interestingly, just the context, obviously, the whole public sector is under significant ongoing sustained pressure because of where we are with resources. Uh, between 2007 
and 2012-13 resources in the Scottish Government, cash terms in, in control increased by 6.4 and local government it's by 8.9, but obviously they, they both face different challenges. So how we, and, and, and particularly around the issues that Mary raised about issues to do with the elderly, etc. So how we maximise resources for local government is going to be hugely important. So I was really quite surprised when I re read the report at paragraph 95 to find in, in the circumstances that the, we have, you know, that sustained pressure on resources that actually um, the overall level of reserves has increased by 174 million pounds now to 1.86 billion. Now we all know why reserves are there, mm -hmm. but you would have imagined in times of financial challenge that actually reserves increasing seems to me to be going against the grain about how we might be best use the money rather than the opposite way around. Because that's a huge amount of money, 1.86 billion pounds. Absolutely, and, and as I said earlier, we've been certainly looking at over the course of the years, and the, 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 the trend has been to, uh, for increasing reserves. And the ones we're talking about here are the ones that are not the products we're accounting. This actually represents cash that's that potentially available. I think it's always important to keep in mind that of that, there's a, there's a relatively small element of that, which is £312 million across all councils, that has not got some intention for the future. I want to come back to that specific sum. Okay. Right, okay. No, but, but sorry, only we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, but um, I, think, I think the position the Commission's taken is, is, is the right one over the years, which is not to specify how much should be held in reserve, but to monitor it. And I think the principal thing is, I think as I said earlier as well, is about reserves policies that are absolutely clear as to why that money is there and what it's going to be used for. Because I don't think, uh, even with all councils now having policies, as to just how transparent they are about uh, why the reserves are there and what they're going to do with them. Um, I think that, the, um, that there needs to be more detail about how they've been built up and what the components of that are. And even where we use this phrase, earmarked, what exactly are they earmarked for? And then to get some sense to come back after having made those decisions and made those things public, what, is the, what, what, what has changed in the year? Why have they got smaller or bigger? One thing I would add, of course, is that this is the first time in a whole number of years, in the number of years that we've been looking at this, where the amount of uh, available reserves has actually fallen. There's, a, there's an exhibit later on in the report that shows that. And that perhaps suggests, among all the other things, borrowing and all the other components of financial management, that councils are starting to use these to support, uh, to support expenditure. And I think we say in the report as well, it's a really important point with reserves and for, you know, we talk about training for elected members and finances must be one of the things that must be uh, at the front of the list to get a fuller understanding because council's com finances are complex. But the point I'm tr trying to get to is that the reserves are there and they can only be used once. They're not there to sustain services year in and year out. So I think it's important things about transparency and accountability there. Yeah, but you would think... Want to come in there? Oh, sorry, apologies. Just very briefly, and I think it's also worth saying that councils would probably argue that some of that money that's been put into reserves is designed to save money in the longer term. So I think they're coming they're coming to a period that has been tough and it's going to continue to be tough. Some councils are expecting it to be even tougher than it has been in the next couple of years. Yeah. So I guess they would argue, and we, we mentioned some of the things in 96, that, um, that those reserves can be used for, like change programmes, voluntary early release programmes, those kinds of things, which have a cost up front, but then will save you money later on. Now, as Gordon says... We still think there can be more transparency and better reporting and monitoring of all of that, but it's not the case, I don't think, that they are necessarily just sitting on a big pile of cash. Um, they are, uh, in many places, looking to use it for something which, if it works, should release some savings into the future. What surprises me, though, is why some of that hasn't been used already to make the changes that need to be made already, given the scale of the challenge that's still to come. And we saw that from the Auditor General's report a couple of weeks ago, um, in terms of overall expenditure available to Scotland, project projections are something between three and four billion pounds further reductions in expenditure. So you would think that that money would be being that actually that should be dropping already to make the changes that are required to get the reshaping that needs to be done. And, I'm, I'm, and so that, that frustrates me to see that that is actually increasing. So, and, but I'm not getting the sense that actually. We know we, we, we're getting to the, really to the bottom of what all that money is about, and how and how can we get there a bit quicker to make sure it's used properly? 
it's a frustration you hear. But I can I can understand that, and there's no doubt that it feels counterintuitive that as money's going yeah. down, the reserves are going up for mm -hmm. sure. In a sense, you you might have thought that we, the, yeah. we might have been putting money away when we had more money to put away, if you know what I mean. But I suppose there is also a thing about um, the financial pressure is really focusing mm -hmm. some minds and people begin to take some more difficult decisions about transformation. I think, as you say, it, it, and we will continue to monitor it, and we can again. This will form part of our programme development thinking if, in, in, if we do want to get under the skin of this a bit more, um, is, as you say, what, what continues to happen. If it continues to rise, yeah. then I think that's absolutely right. You'd want to ask some serious questions about that. I'd certainly like to have seen some of this used in spend to save measures earlier. This, Aye, the, that's sure. the points I'm really trying to get at. Yeah. Now, that £312 of un, un, free reserves, what an unusual concept, free reserves. Now, that was happening in central government central government would be getting a kick in for not using all its money properly. So why is that free reserve pot there and why is it not being allocated to the front line properly as part of a properly managed process? Um, I, th I think it's uh, firstly, it's gone down a bit from the previous year. Um, but I think the, the point is that um, I'm trying to think, it, it, it represents a relatively small, I think it, I think the figure I calculated was about six days of expenditure for councils, just to put it into context. I think the, uh, the notion of having money available to deal with things that are unforeseen is, prud is prudent. Um, I can think of things where, where for example, if, uh, if, if you get a, a, you know, a worse winter than perhaps we've had in the last couple of years, that money's available for things like... Your normal reserve pot's about. This is a, this is a, this is a free reserve. Yeah. Well, that, no, it's like, I, I would, we use the word free. I think, I think I'd rather or use un the word... Or unearmarked. Yeah. Unearmarked. I think, I, yeah. I, I think um, we better think there's a contingency well, to have money available for the things that may come up, whether, you know, the, the aspects of weather, flooding, uh, you know, severe winters and that type of thing. I think, um, I think from our point of view as auditors, I think it's uh, reassuring that there's a level of contingency there without trying to specify what that might be. But I think it's right in a big, compl complicated business that councils that there is money available for the unforeseen as part of overall financial planning. Six billion there. Well, no, the, the three hundred. Yeah. No, there's general fund balances. Three hundred twelve. Yeah. Yeah. I think the point is, is is well made, and one of the interesting things about this is that, you know, instinctively I think for most members of the public, a reserve is the rainy day thing. It's for the unexpected stuff, and that's kind of what you would expect. There's no doubt that the use of reserves in this development of a earmarked and unearmarked reserves is a relatively recent yes. phenomenon. And that's why the Commission have been reporting regularly on much more transparency and better reporting on that, because it is an unusual thing for most people to get their heads around. And as you say, Mr Crawford, better understanding of what they're actually using it for. I mean, I think if you were if you were sitting just with the 312 million, I think most people would kind of get that, that it's a pot just in case. But as you say, that's on top of the um, significant amount of money that's all also there. So. It was just slightly uh, uh, related to the issue of maximising use of resources. We had a discussion earlier about indebtedness, but we've also got a, a circumstance um, in terms of an increase, as described on page, just give me a second, um, 35 under assets, that actually Council's assets are increasing now to, to £38 billion. Pounds. That's, again, a, a heck of a money that's sitting in asset use. and. I guess the general question is, are councils making the best use of the assets that they have? I'm not suggesting that we should be selling off the, the, the family silver, but are they making the best use of that asset base? Because you would have thought that that could be a potential generator of additional income if we could get better flexibility into the system. And the, the Commission, uh, I think there's, there's various pieces of work that have been done in, in recent years that the Commission's uh, asked Audit Scotland to do, looking at asset management plans. So there's a, a whole range of uh, issues there, resources, and not just about the uh, money, it's about uh, people and the property that's available as well. Um, so, I th yeah, I, I was just going to go on and say, I think uh, we had a conversation earlier this morning about community planning, for example, and I think that, uh, you know, statements by government and COSLA about making better use of the overall resource in the area is part of that picture about making better use of the buildings that are available for, you know, whether it's to do with uh, the space that councils have or the space that colleges have, for example, but looking at the resources available in a geographic area as part of community planning, I think is part of the solution to that. But certainly the point you make a point a point well made about making better use of what's available for service delivery at this point. Understanding from across local government about what they're actually doing. 
in trying to manage that resource more better to maximise income from it. Part, part, part of the long term, we, we, we focused this morning on long term financial planning uh, at a couple of points. Uh, from our point of view, it's about the totality of the resource that's available. So we're looking for longer term planning that looks at the use of resources in terms of uh, the, the finances available, the people that are available and the assets that are available. And in, in the better running councils or the ones that have got uh, a better uh, grip of this, these strategies are in interconnected. So that the implications of finance, for example, on uh, new building and assets is closely linked. Yeah. So that's, that's when it's working at its best. I think it's fair to say that not all councils are where we want them to be. The report we did on on uh, road maintenance, um, I think I'm right in saying there's still a fair number of councils that don't have road asset management plans. As you'll know, I come from a background where T-side contracts have operated for a while and the amount of savings and because of the scale of activity that can be achieved, they're just astonished that there's not more local authorities following the same sort of model. Can you, I want to go in a slightly different area if, if anybody else is wanting to come in and supplement. Tavi Scott, briefly, but... We will need to curtail this debate because we've got a very full agenda, but uh, Tavi Scott... Yeah, can I just, to back to just Bruce on Bruce Crawford's uh, line of questioning there, do all 32 local authorities have a long-term financial plan that takes into account the reserves that you've been describing to Mr Crawford? Absolutely not. I mean, the, the, the Scotland's Public Finances report that we brought to the committee uh, two weeks ago was very much making that point. There's a, there's a small number of councils look to that longer term, by which we mean over five years. Uh, there's, there's more medium-term planning done between two and five years, but in terms of that longer-term plan that uh, looks at how reserves are going to be applied and, in fact, uh, connecting it earlier to the conversation about the implications of things like the ageing population, what does that mean in our area in terms of the demographic profile? That's, that's, not, that's not something that's particularly well embedded. Very fair point, Gordon. Out of the 32, how many do have long-term financial plans? Do, do we know? It's a, a small number, I would... Um, Five, eight, something along yeah. these sort of lines. So that's the challenge. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. One other area, uh, convener. Um, look, learning from others. Now, local government in Scotland is under challenge. We know that but since I think in um, since 2010, in real terms, in England, the reduction has been 14%. In local government spending in Scotland, it's 3%. So they're obviously going through a challenge which is much more extreme here than here in Scotland. So there must be opportunities to learn from the way they are tackling the scale of their difficulty that can be applied here. And is there any of that actual cross-border discussion going on about where we can get better, you know, better understanding of how they are dealing with that significant problem? The short answer is not enough. Yeah. Um, so. there's, a, there's a wonderful phrase in a, a, a Welsh uh, report recently on public services that said, "Good, good practice is a bad traveller." And I think that's very true. I think I think we, you know, I, I think the Commission could be doing more, along with other scrutiny bodies, of highlighting examples of uh, good practice, perhaps in a yearly a yearly di digest. It goes back to the point in Alios. I think there are some examples in in England of where Alios have been actually used to improve services. You with me? Um, and I think we need to try and capture that as well and, and share that practice within Scottish local government. Back to this whole leadership issue. Yep. You know, why are we not getting people out there trying to find out, yep. from, from, yep. even from individual yep. authorities, about what the experience is? Well, it, it didn't. It didn't. It didn't help by the UK government abolishing the audit commission. Yeah. Fair point. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, can I just return to this issue about uh, the increase in net indebtedness, gone up by uh, 45 percent over the last nine years? So gone up from 9.1 billion. By an additional 4.2 billion, that's you know, almost half a billion pounds each year being added on. Um, whose job is it at a national level to monitor and to, to who's accountable for that rise and keeping an eye on it at a national level, or is it just local individual local authorities? It's, it's with individual local authorities as part of the Prudential Code that we, uh, we mentioned earlier. So there's, there's a series of indicators in there that, uh, in terms of financial sustainability and the like, that. Um, Councils are required to have a, 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 a policy for this that sets out how they will monitor and uh, look at what's affordable to them and sustainable in the longer term. But it's very much a local decision based on the local financial position. And that regime has been in since about 2004. You said earlier, Mr Smale, that um, uh, part of that increase has been due to the, the increased use of PPP and PFI. In fact, I'm, I'm always surprised by this government who speaks so strongly against PFIs and PPPs, how much they use them, but how much of this uh, increase of 4.2 billion has been due to the use of 
private finance or revenue finance resources? I, I don't have that information to hand. That this, this was just, again, a bit of contextual information here, but we can, we can supply that to you if you find that helpful. Yeah, I think it would be helpful, yes. The, the government, one of the things that the, the actions that John Swinney has taken, which I think we've all approved of, is the idea of setting a 5% cap on revenue finance capital expenditure. But the difficulty with that cap is that it doesn't include a lot. It doesn't include everything. Uh, and in fact, it specifically excludes local government uh, revenue financed expenditure. Is that something that would be of concern to you at all? Um, I think we're, we're talking today about local government, so we're looking at the local government borrowing. Um, we're certainly doing some work uh, carried on on behalf of the Auditor General, looking at financial reporting in the round and particularly looking at the implications for financial reporting of the new taxes that will come into play from April next year. But um, it's certainly something that we want to develop as part of that work, looking at how all aspects of finances are reported, the transparency around about that. And as part of that work, we'll be looking at the, that very question about the, the, the cap that, uh, that's been applied in, in, in that central government context. And that is, sorry. sorry. No, big I think we also wants no. to add in. I was just going to say that in, in terms of this, um, in the context of this report, I think there are a couple of really interesting things about this this number. Clearly, the, the number in itself going up uh, a lot. I think there's something about the complexity of some of those arrangements. Uh, again, coming back to the like the members in particular, being able to fully understand what it is they're signing up to. And the other thing that's really important in this context is the is the recurring impact on revenue budgets. So, do councils fully understand the impact of taking on more borrowing? for annual running costs and the extent to which that's going to obviously be spent on financing the loan rather than delivering frontline services. So I guess that would be our specific interest in this report, Mr McIntosh, well, looking, as we say, to understand more of it and really to get under the skin of this issue in the, in the report that we're doing for, Council, uh, for the Accounts Commission towards the end of the year. It be fair to say you'd agree that there should be a, a greater level of scrutiny, uh, perhaps at a national level, of this figure? Or accountability, maybe, a better word. Um. I'll let the chair take that one before I speak on the commission. I think we're tre treading into a dangerous water here. <laughs> the, you know, local government's accountability is to the is to is to the to the public, to the people of Scotland. The end of the finance comes from central government, and uh, do you not think that there should be a level of accountability for that finance? This is revenue finance, a lot of it. Through the ballot box, yes. Okay. Well, that leads me on very nicely, actually, because you talk about governance uh, quite a lot and political tensions. Um, there's, there's not much about local democracy. Uh, in recent years, we've seen um, you know, the centralisation of the police service, the fire service, closure of local courts, closure of local police stations, regionalisation of the colleges. Um, a, a marked tendency to centralisation generally of governance arrangements in Scotland. Do you think that has an effect on local democracy and the effectiveness of local democracy? I think, I think the, those, are, those are not issues for the Commission. They're not within the Commission's remit. These are decisions for government to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to make. I think it's, um, there may be an interesting academic study further down the line as to the impact of that generally on long-term and local democracy, but that's, it's not a subject for the Commission. So, so governance is of something of concern to you, but, but the actual decisions over which local councillors have influence, that's not a matter for the Council Commission? But issues like, well, I mean, the issue of the single police force, COSLA is the body that represented local government interests in relation to that and expressed its view very clearly to government uh, that it wasn't in favour of a single police force and that debate took place. Um, you know, I think uh, councils as democratic bodies make their views known. For example, the closure of local court, courts, I think all councils put in representations in relation to that. And I think that's, the, that's how democracy operates and I think that's, that's, that's the way it works in Scotland. I think on a, on a more practical level, I think one of the impacts that will be very interesting to see how this plays out is through that community planning process, um, because it is now the case that if you if you take aside the kind of voluntary sector and private sector interests on community planning partnerships, the councils are now the only public sector body that is local in that sense, as you say, colleges are regional, police, fire, Scottish Enterprise, higher, all more national or regional bodies. So it will, it will be interesting to see how some of those tensions between local priorities and national priorities play out in that context, and that clearly is something that we'll be uh, very interested to see how it plays out. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Um, one of the things I 
remember even knocking over from my days as a councillor was the issue relating to equal pay and the pressures uh, on equal pay. And notice uh, uh, 17, 18, 19, you, uh, you, you point out that uh, there's obviously still pressures there and uh, I see there's a, also a review, but it's really a case of what I'm trying to get here is are there some councils handling this better than others? Um, are we any real distance forward? Because this has been going on for years and years and years. And uh, obviously, the further it goes on, the more pressure there's going to be on the uh, local authority funding. Um, and the fact that there's quite a significant um, amount of settlements that don't appear to have been dealt with yet. And um, also, as you point out in paragraph 18, the unquantified workforce resources and associated cost issues. So how far are we down the road here of actually seeing uh, a page in a future report and saying that these have been dealt with, um, the resource issues have been dealt with, and this is where we are? I wish I could, I could give you that assurance. Uh, it's worth making the point, firstly, that equal pay is not just an issue in local governments, it's an issue in the National Health Service and, indeed, prospectively, an issue in Alios as, as well. But you're right, the, the, the sums are significant. We're having, the Commission's having a discussion with the controller of audit as to um, what work we might do that would add value. I think there are two potential uh, areas. One, the extent to which councils undertook a proper risk assessment um, in, in considering equal pay claims. For example, as you they allude to the impact that that's had on HR staff and spending a huge amount of their time dealing with this particular issue as opposed to dealing with wider HR strategies in the council. And secondly, I think there's an important relationship between the huge amount of money that's been uh, used up in settling equal pay claims and value for money. The balance between um, making these payments but also at the same time as a trade-off, modernising conditions of service in local government and reducing the cost there. You follow me? Uh, and, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I think there's an issue as to whether there would be a benefit um, to the public and indeed to councils in undertaking a study looking at those particular areas. Okay, the interest of time. Prof, is it a brief? brief well, it would need to be you know, one brief question and then I'm moving on. All right, okay. thanks for that. Um, um, could I ask you about the role of councillors, uh, Mr Sinclair? You, you said in your presentation really that we're placing more and more demands on our councillors and having been one for, for a number of years, I can sympathise. And I, I see the, the demands placed on our local councillors going through the roof. Um, they, not only do they, do they do more work, but they serve bigger communities with the multi-member system and so on. Do you see, you've opened up a discussion about job descriptions there, do you see that naturally leading us to a discussion about remuneration and time off? Uh, I, I don't personally think that the councillors get enough time off to carry out their public duties and that partly explains why I think the kind of, the kind of profile of the local councillor hasn't really changed. It, it's older people that are retired or it's people who work part time and still do a full time job somewhere else. Do you see a discussion going in that direction to begin to seriously address that? What you raise are not new issues. They're, they're, they've, been, they've been around for a long time and I think they're, they're valid points. And I think if you're having that debate about job descriptions, about training, I think the, the issue of how you attract a wider pool of talent to um, serving councils, the issue of time off from employers, the issue of remuneration has to be part of that mix as well. Yeah. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for contributing to a very full discussion. Uh, I, I suspect that this is something which um, is going to become uh, a bigger issue across Scottish public life as the impact of uh, financial restraints um, kicks in. So, um, you know, thank you both for your individual contribution and also for the work that's been done by Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Um, just change over. Do, do, do members wish a, a break at this point? No? No? If not, we'll, we'll just press on. Um, we have a, a section 23 report on self-directed um, support.
And uh, this morning we have with us Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General for Scotland, and she's accompanied by Fraser McKinley, Director and Controller of Audit, Claire Sweeney, and Cathy McGregor. Okay, welcome. Auditor General, would you like to make uh, an opening contribution? Good morning. Um, the report that we're bringing to the committee today looks at progress with implementing a policy called self-directed support. Self-directed support is a major change to the way that people with social care needs are supported in Scotland. It affects vital services that help people with care needs, such as older people and people with disabilities, to live their lives as fully as they can. And to make this new policy work, people who need support will work as equal partners with professionals to plan their care, which may be delivered through different or innovative services or services that are more tailored to their individual and specific needs. The Scottish Government and COSLA launched a 10-year strategy for self-directed support in 2010, and the Social Care Self-Directed Support Scotland Act was developed as part of that strategy. The Act places a duty on councils from April this year to offer people who are newly assessed as needing social care a wider range of options for choosing and controlling their support. People already receiving social care before April will be offered these options the time their next needs are reviewed. People who are newly assessed as needing care are entitled as of now to access to the new way of planning and managing their support. The Scottish Government has allocated £42.2 million to help councils prepare for self-directed support and the intention is that it will reshape the way that the total £2.8 billion every year is spent on those services by councils across Scotland. The report before you assesses readiness for the Act, together with progress in implementing the self-directed support strategy three years on. Implementation is at a relatively early stage, and the report's intended to examine progress and help with implementation over the next few years. The report identifies risks, highlights examples of good practice, and makes a series of recommendations for the Scottish Government and councils. The report's also very relevant to the new integrated health and social care partnerships and NHS boards and councils do need to be clear about the implications of self-directed support before they put their new partnership arrangements in place locally. The report highlights that there's still a lot of work to do. Progress among councils varies and some will have to move more quickly in the next few years to put in place the cultural and practical changes that are required. To do this, councils will need continued support from the Scottish Government, along with effective leadership from senior managers and councillors. We found that councils have adopted different methods for allocating what they spend on social care support to people with care needs. Exhibit 6 on page 33 of the report summarises each model, together with the risks and advantages that each of them brings. There's also a series of broader financial risks that councils need to consider as they implement self-directed support and the new ways of allocating money that it brings with it. Again, Exhibit 7 on pages 36 and 37 provides more details. Councils need to manage these risks carefully so that they're both managing their budgets well and making sure that they don't unnecessarily limit people's choice and control over the support that they receive. Social care professionals have welcomed the self-directed support policy because it's got the potential to improve the quality of people's lives. Self-directed support will work best if a range of different services and support are available locally so that people get a choice about the support that they would like to receive. We highlight in the report that councils now need to work more closely with people who need support and with their carers, with providers and with local communities to develop these choices. Convener, the report makes a number of recommendations to improve the implementation of self-directed support over the next few years as it comes fully into effect. We recommend that the Scottish Government should have a strategy to measure and report on progress and be able to demonstrate the effect that the policy is having on the lives of people with care needs. It should also continue to coordinate guidance and information to help councils with challenging areas and issues that they need to deal with as self-directed support is rolled out. The report also highlights issues for councils and NHS boards to consider as they establish their new partnership arrangements for health and social care integration under the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act that also comes into effect this year. Convener, as always, my colleagues and I are happy to answer questions. Uh, Will the coffee, do you want to come in? Because I was aware that you were curtailed. Uh, the thank you very much, Convener. Aye. Thanks very much for that. Um, see you on the, the transitional funding, Auditor General, the 40 
two million. Is it still too early to give us an indication of whether there have been gains made in there? I know quite a lot of that money has been allocated to providing the transition framework and so on to affect these changes, but how soon do you think we can expect to see some gains made in there and savings? The, the £42 million runs over a four-year period, but actually, which actually ends this year in 2014-15. So in many ways, it's not too soon to say what it's been spent on. We know that, for example, the, of the amount that's gone to councils, every council has used at least some of it uh, to put in place a coordinator for self-directed support, and most of their money has been put into new staff and staff training to develop it. What we don't know is what impact that £42 million has had on the difference that it makes to the lives of people with care needs. Um, and that's really why the recommendation about moving on from the seven success factors which the government's identified for this policy, which are good and clear, but moving on from there to the measures they will use to demonstrate the impact on people's lives is so important. It's what this policy is all about, and it's, it's really about reshaping the way that whole £2.8 billion is managed and spent in future, rather than about the way the £42 billion is used to, to sort of influence that. So I think that's a bigger question. See the evidence of, of that gain taking place next year, the year after? The government uh, is currently producing the measures that are intended to underpin those seven success factors that we set out in the report, and I think they're committed to starting to publish that information this year. So we'll start to get the information here. My expectation is that it will take a while for it to really um, be able to show the difference that's being made. Claire may want to add to that, I think. I think just to also mention that um, the self-directed support options will be fully offered to people who are coming up for assessment. So we heard from our case study councils that it will take a little while to get everybody through that system as their, their care needs are reassessed. So it will take a little time for that to be uh, offered to everybody with, with particular care needs in Scotland. So it will take time. Question. Thanks very much, Convener. So, on the whole risk assessment thing, you, your reports, Auditor General, are always full, in my opinion, of good recommendations for local authorities or whoever, and you've got some extensive advice at the back there on risk assessment, risk planning, and mitigation, and so on. Do you find that these these risk assessments that you produce are shared and commonly held by the authorities that you're perhaps delivering the message to? Because you always talk about planning and the need to plan and to be aware of risk. Do you, so, do you find that your commentary at the back of a report like this is shared by the authorities that are charged with implementing these processes. I think, as always, it varies. We don't rely just on what's in the report. For most of our reports now, we also produce uh, things like checklists for elected members, checklists for board members of NHS boards of the questions they should be asking in carrying out the role you were talking about with Douglas Sinclair um, earlier. Um, and we know from the follow-up work that our auditors do that some, uh, some health boards, some councils are great at picking those up and really working through what the implications are. Others perhaps don't give it as much attention. Um, and it's one of the things that we're focusing on as we think about our new strategy for public audit is how we can really help to make a difference in that way in future. Hey, Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, you make a number of um, uh, comments um, in the report about the fact that uh, moving to SDS is not about, as you say, it's not about providing services more cheaply, but it is happening at a time of falling budgets. Uh, I think you've pointed out right at the beginning in paragraph 11 that um, council spending on social care services decreased by 5% in real terms from 2.97 billion uh, to 2.84, and that was just in three years. Um, is there, have you been able to assess whether or not that is the perception or that is the concern that um, uh, users and clients are feeling about the move to SDS? Does it, is it creating anxiety? Is that colouring their perception of the change to SDS or not? I'll ask Claire to come in in a moment and give you a bit more colour of that, but it's clearly one of the risks. Um, I think the consensus from everybody involved in this is, in principle, this is a great policy, giving people who need care more choice, more say in the sort of support they need and where it comes from can only be a good thing in helping them live lives that are as near to what we all expect as possible. But doing that is tougher at a time when money is tight and, and likely to continue so. One of the things that we think is key is the way in which councils and their partners in 
the NHS talk to the people directly affected, um, to the, the third sector and private organisations involved in delivering care services and the communities more widely about what this policy is about and involving them in actually shaping it. We've got some examples in the report of where that's been done really well and also where, where it's been done less well, at least initially, and those suspicions have um, really uh, picked up and in some cases uh, sort of overshadowed the potential of the policy. That's not to say the financial challenges aren't real. They are, and they'll continue to do so with both the financial constraints we expect to see for the foreseeable future and the growing numbers of older people in particular who, particular who need care, but involving people both at the individual level and at a community level in understanding this and helping to shape it, we think, is key. Do you want to add to that, Claire? Yeah, I think just uh, two things to mention. Um, the, the, there's two aspects to this. Uh, there's a conversation with the local community about the services that they, they want to see that need to be in place locally, but also what came through very strongly to us in carrying out this work and, and talking to people involved in delivering frontline services uh, was a real passion for the, the, the increased focus around the quality of the conversation with the individual about what their needs were. Uh, we've highlighted in the report that there are different points during that process where the money might be talked about. We saw that happening very differently across Scotland, for the example, the case study areas we looked at. Um, so for some areas, the money was not discussed until much later into the conversation about people's needs. And for some areas, that happened much earlier. Um, and exactly as we've just said, uh, it's really about what, what comes first, what the focus is. The, the principle of this policy is about the focus being on assessing the needs and then working out different ways of best achieving those needs, meeting those needs that suit the person. Uh, so a lot of Real enthusiasm for people involved in, in delivering services, but also from people receiving them for the potential that this policy has. Uh, just on, on another uh, issue that, the, that you raise, which is about the monitoring, the success of the, the policy, um, from sort of from paragraphs thirty six onwards, and that exhibit four, you talk about the measures of success. Uh, from what I see, though, that we're, we're not, at a national level, we don't seem to be measuring the percentage of take-up of SDS uh, or uh, any milestones in terms of uh, percentage take-up along the way over the 10-day journey. Is that, is that right? Um, the, what we say in paragraph 38 is that this budget government is currently putting in place the measures that will let them assess progress against what are probably better to call success factors in Exhibit 4. Um, and that's work that's underway now, and they intend to publish it from 2014 onwards. Um, our rec recommendation is really making the same point, that it has to be the right success factor that the policy does deliver a better quality of life for individuals. How you measure that needs some careful thought. Um, and to be able to demonstrate that the policy is doing that, um, that it's doing it in ways that are manageable within the resources available and are leading to new, more flexible services that better need, meet people's needs, needs some more work that's not yet complete. We think it's key, and this year is the time we're told that it's underway. Mm -hmm. Trying to find the figure. The, the number of people, here's just paragraph 18, uh, the number of people who have actually taken up direct payment is very small, isn't it? Is it not? Are you surprised how small it is? ways I am. I think it's important that we distinguish between direct payments um, and the wider uh, objectives of the self-directed support policy. Mm -hmm. Direct payments have been in place for more than 10 years now. They've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is surprising that, as we say in the report, only 5,400 people received direct payments in 2012-13. That's less than 5% of the people receiving social care and only about 2% of the money that's spent on social care. So it is a very small proportion. We say in the report that there aren't figures available for how many people are receiving what we describe as option two, which is the ability to um, have very much more flexibility about the services that, that you receive, that, that you put around to, to meet your needs, but where the council continues to manage the budget. There's no indication of how many people are receiving that. Um, and again, that seems like a very important measure for understanding how well the policy is being rolled out and starting to understand the effect that it's having on people's lives. I think it's true to say that the self-directed support policy was a response to the uh, a recognition of the fact that direct payments probably weren't having the impact that was intended for them. So it's a way of giving more flexibility for how the money is used um, and giving people uh, the option to get that flexibility without having to take the whole responsibility for managing the, bu managing the budget if they don't want to. Fraser, do you want to add to no, that? I'm happy no, to okay. so, then we don't know how many people have been asked, as it were, whether they want to move to SDS. 
Um, we know that there's only 5% on direct payments, but do we know how many people have been taken through the process and have declined direct payments that have gone for council provision of services? Option two. I, I don't think in relation just to direct payments we do know that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, self-directed support only came in as a requirement for new people, people mm -hmm. newly assessed as requiring care from April this year. Um, but that's the big unknown, how many people may have been in that category previously um, and how many are still entirely new to this question of sitting down with a professional and talking through what, what they want their lives to look like and what sort of care support would help them to achieve that. Claire, do you want to add to that? Just to say that we, we came in early to look at self-directed support at this point in time, um, to look at the readiness for, for the impl implications of the Act. Um, and, and what we saw when we carried out the work was that there were arrangements in place um, that council should be in a position to offer that to newly assessed people in line with the Act. Um, the bigger issue, I think, is the, the, the whole scale cultural change that this brings to delivering services very differently, different ways of working with people to assess their needs and, and, and think about new options that have not been tried before. So we saw some quite good examples of really innovative practice happening around it, but it is the cultural change that will, will make this a success and that will take time. Indeed. But are you, you're not expecting, or, or would you wish to see you know, milestones, you know, um, numbers of people at the moment just the, the new applicants uh, but would you expect the government to set you know a figure for the number of existing uh, service users to be offered SDS? The um, agreement between the government and COSLA has been that this is a long-term policy and that the 10 years from 2010 to 2020 is the sort of window for getting it fully embedded with the sorts of cultural changes that Claire's been talking about. <coughs> the councils that we talked to in doing the audit work I think pretty, pretty uniformly told us they expect to have um, got through people who are currently receiving care in the, the more traditional way and given them a choice of the newer way, self-directed support, within the next three or four years. Um, and I think it might be helpful to, to make that expectation clearer if it's the, the shared agreement between COSLA and Scottish Government. Um, there will be challenges in doing that because of the potential knock-on effect on the existing services and the, the need to manage budgets in ways that are, are not fully understood at this stage because it does depend on individual people's <coughs> preferences and needs. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I thought the point, in fact, uh, you answered my question uh, in response to Ken McIntosh, but uh, self-directed support is not new. It's been in for, uh, it was passed in the Act in 2001, and the regulations came through on direct payments in 2003. So this is 11 years old, and we're now four years into a 10-year strategy. Um, but in my experience, anyone who applied for direct payments over the last um, 11 years was mainly because they were dissatisfied with the council services. So it wasn't a, a sort of positive uh, move. It was a move because they did not get the home care time that was uh, in accordance with the assessment. But... Um, uh, uh, I think that also led to accusations that uh, councils wanted to retain their monopoly provision. But uh, on that point, if we look at 5,400 people receiving direct payments out of 152,000 receiving social care services, um, I think my first question is why are only 3% of people receiving home care when... Uh, your first paragraph on page uh, six, uh, five, SDS is based on fairness, respect, equality, dignity and autonomy for all. Uh, every party is in support of this. But if you, you know, when I look at Exhibit 7, I do actually have some understanding for local councils and why it is difficult for them. You know, if they're employing home care staff, Obviously, they want to make sure that these home care staff have the hours of work. They don't want to be making them redundant. And I do notice there are a number of significant financial risks councils need to address when implementing SDS. Do you think, uh, well, A, first of all, why are only, you know, after 11 years of legislation, why do we only have 3% of people receiving in control of their own home care uh, and support. And are these financial risks facing councils that you've outlined on 
uh, one, two, uh, two pages. Do you think that do you think that this report and do you think that the financial risks are probably not going to lead to a significantly higher increase? I'm just saying, will they be an obstacle to more people taking up uh, self-directed support over the next six years of this strategy? take the, the first question and then yeah. ask colleagues to pick up the second yeah. one. Um, I, you're absolutely right that direct payments aren't new at all. They've been around for more than 10 years and take-up has been low. Um, I think that's because the direct, direct payments policy was really about saying in uh, social work services, we'll carry on providing services we've always done, but if you would like to take your share of the money, you can spend it as you will. What's different about self-directed support is to say for all of that social care, the starting point should be the needs and preferences yeah. of the individual, putting them in the driving seat. So it, rather than being a sort of opt-out, as I think you've rightly described it, from the mainstream services, in inverted commas, it turns that on its head and puts the, the person needing care in the driving seat. It doesn't say to everybody, you must take a budget and manage it. That's one of the options available. There's also the second option, which is to say, um, we'll assess a budget and we'll manage it on your behalf in, in conversation with you. Or you can carry on as before, if that suits you, tapping into the, the traditional services that we've offered. So my expectation is that it will lead to, to much greater take-up because um, it really it changes the starting point for all of this and works it on from there. Now, doing that has to be a good thing in terms of giving more choice to people and reflecting the fact we're all different and different things matter to us. But as you rightly say, it does bring some real um, challenges and risks that councils need to manage to be able to do that in a way that protects individuals and also keeps their services and their budget sustainable. I'll maybe ask Fraser to pick up that, that second part of it and colleagues to chip in if that would help. And I think, Mrs Callan, just to emphasise Caroline's point, on, on Exhibit 1 where we try to set out um, self-directed support, I think the thing that took me a while to get my head around is it's not really a choice of taking self-directed support or not. Self-directed support is a completely different way of providing services. And in a sense, the bit at the top of that Exhibit 1 is almost the more important bit of the process, I think. I think that's where the, that's where the really significant cultural change comes because as you say some of the other by the time you get to the bottom half of that picture with the different ways of delivering it most of those are kind of in place with the exception of uh, option two which is a bit newer but actually it's that whole process of discussion and starting with the the user that's that's the really big change and in that context as you've rightly pointed out exhibit seven we've tried to point out some of the things that councils and others need to think about in delivering this. But the starting point has to be the needs of the service user and, and everything falls from that. So there's that kind of pretty fundamental mindset shift, I think, that's, that's the important thing here. The Act of 2001, but I do seem to remember that uh, it was either a council had a duty to provide or it was individuals had a right to ask. Mm. But I, I can't quite remember the balance. But I do appreciate this has gone further. But, you know, there was a lot of work went into sure. direct payments. And 11 years later, we've got 3%. I think that is pretty disappointing. And just my, my final point is really um, one of your key recommendations. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, should engage and maintain contact with COSLA, Director of Social Work, to coordinate guidance and information to support this and also have a strategy to measure and report. Um, I'm just wondering why that's a recommendation. Would we not expect them to do that anyway? We would, um, and as this committee has uh, focused in on the past, the strategy for measuring isn't always robust enough to really demonstrate that the uh, policy is having the impact on people's lives that it was intended to. That's, that's almost always because that's a difficult thing to do. But for something as fundamental as this that can have such a significant effect on the lives of vulnerable people in society, we think it's key that it, it moves beyond those general and laudable success factors onto really how it will be possible for the government to demonstrate that it is giving people much more choice over the services and having an effect on their ability to live the sorts of lives that we would all hope to do. OK, thank you. Uh, Tavish Scott. Thank you, I just wanted to pick up the um, evidence that the Accounts Commission gave us this morning about leadership and the understandable things that Douglas Sinclair said about corporate responsibilities of both senior elected members and um, 
uh, senior council officials, and then your paragraph 26. And if I read paragraph 26 right, it says that only nine councils out of 32 across Scotland are providing detailed updates to their elected members uh, over the past couple of years through committee papers. Is that not a damning indictment of, of exactly what Douglas Sinclair was telling us earlier on? Um, certainly for a policy that is this fundamental to a mm. social care, um, to, to the provision of social care and the way it's thought about, I think we would expect all councils to be keeping at all councils' offices to be fully engaged with councillors about the way it's being planned and delivered locally, progress that's being made with that, um, and the results that's having. Um, now, we say that there, there's a lot for councils in general to do. It's also true that some are doing better than others around it, but I think this is a great example of the sorts of policies you'd, you'd expect that sort of continuing discussion between members and officers. So in a year's, no, absolutely. And in a year's time, do you think the other 23 who are not, not currently providing information to their elected members will be? What will make them do it? This report is a contribution to it, um, mm -hmm. and the local auditors that uh, the Commission appoints to all 32 councils will be keeping an eye on this because of both its impact on people's lives but also the financial mm -hmm. risks that it brings with it. Fraser, do you want to pick that up as control of all it? Just to agree with all of that and also to say that we are, as, as Claire said earlier, looking at this relatively early in the formal yeah, implementation sure. of the policy and therefore without prejudging any decisions that the Auditor General and the Commission might want to make. Um, it would be surprising if we didn't want to return to this mm -hmm. at some point um, in the next also, few years. So, as Mary Scanlon rightly said, we're four years into a 10 year strategy. Indeed. And 23 councils aren't considering this on a regular basis. Indeed. Something way wrong there, isn't and, it? And as you say, that is um, given the fundamental nature of this change, we would expect that to be better than that. Okay. For sure. Fraser, on, McKinley, on that point, is it not the case that the one thing that councillors are getting a lot of information about is the integration of social care and uh, from their own council side and the NHS, don't you think that ranks higher in the context of priorities that elected members are having to deal with at the moment than this particular subject? Um, I, I guess I'm not really in a position to say whether it ranks higher or not. I guess it's a more immediate and obvious yeah. issue for them to grapple with. Right. There's a decision for them to make um, about what kind of model of health and social care and to sure. uh, yeah. And I think what we would like to see very quickly is once they've agreed on a governance model around health and social care, then actually getting into, well, what does that mean yeah. in the context of things like self-directed support? Um, how uh, is that going to work? Um, what are the opportunities to make that better? Um, in an ideal world, you would hope that, in a sense, the conversation might be another way around, that they were thinking about the implications of self-directed support as they were making the decision. Yeah, um, again, we're not, uh, I think, we haven't done the work really to say the extent to which that's happened or not, but there's there's clearly um, a very close connection between those things, and again, we'll be keeping a very close eye on how the different models uh, of health and social care integration are impacting on their ability to deliver this, this new uh, policy change. I agree with that, and I don't think it's possible to separate out yeah. the integration of health and social care and self-directed yeah. support. The way you do one will affect the way you do the other. There are questions that we highlight in the report about um, the, the way in which people may have more choice over the way their health support is planned and funded to give them a pot or a package of care that hangs together. So I wouldn't prioritise them as one being more important. I think this is not quite as wide-reaching initially as the integration of health and social care, but I think they should be being discussed together. But in terms of just making sure this does change over the next year, then there might be some point of the committee asking Cosler how widespread is this being dealt with at council level, based on your paragraph 26. There's an awful lot more to do quickly to ensure senior elected members know what's going on. Would that be fair? I think keeping oversight of what's happening locally and yeah. looking at the way the different models of integration are working and what opportunities they throw up as well as what problems they may entail yeah. would be okay. well worth Thank you. Thank you. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mina. Page 7.2 uh, there, where there's comment made that councils have adopted different methods of allocating the money. Um, that sort of raises to me the, the thought that someone moving from one council area to another might receive a very different service. Uh, and I wonder, is that, is that the point that's being made here? The primary point we're making, although that is a risk, and I'll ask the team to come in on that in a moment, the point we're making refers to the different methods for allocating budgets to individuals that we set out in Exhibit 6 on page 33 of the report. 
Um, and there are two mainstream approaches that we've seen in the work here. The one is really a points-based system that starts off by assessing somebody's needs and assigning them a score depend depending on the sort of intensity of their needs. That score translates into a budget um, which can then be used to buy different forms of care and support to reflect their choices. The other approach is to start off by um, assessing their needs and allocating a budget that um, is aligned to what the traditional uh, form of services would have looked like. Now, in terms of both sort of fairness and equity and managing the risks on the budget overall, they've both got pros and cons that we've tried to set out here. Um, but that they do need to make sure they're flexible enough to respond to both the growing number of people who are likely to need social care in future and to changes in the form of services that may well be needed um, as people choose new forms of care and move away perhaps from some of the traditional things like day centres that have often been the focus of social care in the past. So that's really what we were focusing on rather than the risks of people moving between areas which also need to be considered. So is it, is it only the, those two methods that you've mentioned that you're actually referring to or are there others? Um, I'll ask the team to come in. We found one more which is in the exhibit as well in Perth and Kinross Council. Claire? Yes, that's right. Um, the the solution-led um, model that we mentioned in Exhibit 5 that we saw in Perth and Kinross was slightly different to the other two um, that the Auditor-General has, has described. And I suppose one way of articulating that is it's much more of a, a bottom-up approach. So the conversation with the person about their needs comes first, uh, and the discussion about the resources needed to fit around that package of care in its broadest sense comes much later in the conversation. The focus really is on building, building it up from the bottom, from thinking about what's needed and then thinking about the finances as you go through. Um, the advantage to that is that it puts a lot of trust in frontline social workers to have that conversation and be aware of what the, op the options are and what some of the affordability <coughs> issues might be around that. One of the risks, and we highlight that in the report, is the need for really good controls in a financial sense around that. Um, so we've, we've got a, an example in the report that says a little bit more about what's happening in Perth and Kinross. And what we saw there at the early stages of them moving to this approach was um, weekly financial management meetings. Um, constant discussions between social workers and finance teams to keep a very, very close eye on what the implications for resources were from giving frontline social workers much more um, responsibility for having those discussions with individuals. In essence, it, it is what, free, what um, the self-directed support policy is trying to achieve is that, that, that close connection between building a very individualised package of care or support or services for a person, but there are risks around that and we only saw saw that happening in Perth and Kin Ross and didn't see that elsewhere in Scotland. Are you satisfied that given the different systems that uh, it's adequately transparent, that uh, people can clearly see how, how the allocation is done? I think that's very important. That, that is one of the issues we've tried to draw out in the report, the need for that, that clarity about that discussion. In, in a sense, self-directed support brings that because it is about an individualised package. It is about uh, more clarity about your, the, the care you could get, what the options are and how much that might cost to provide. So self-directed support Put together starts together surely is uh, the critical thing and the transparency in that process is, is very important for confidence. Absolutely, and as self-directed support um, is, is rolled out more broadly across Scotland, we would certainly see that that would, would start to become an advantage of the policy being rolled out. It's not happening for everybody yet, but absolutely that should be happening as part of the discussions that people are having about their care. Just uh, looking at uh, page 12, paragraph 18, this question of the 5%, uh, I notice that it says that 5% of eligible social care users and then it says that the, these direct payments accounted for 2.4% of the council's social care spending. That would imply to me, and tell me if I'm wrong here, that those who have taken this up are perhaps those with less profound needs than others, since they're absorbing a far, le far less than their uh, proportionate share of the budget. That's our assumption. We don't know whether it's the case or not because of the information that's available and not available at the moment. Um, and clearly that in itself has got implications as self-directed support is rolled out across all everybody who gets social care over the next three or four years. Um, understanding 
as um, each person's needs are assessed, both new users and people who are already in the system, what their relative needs are and what the impact of that is on the overall budget and the overall shape of services is key to the rollout of this. And it's why we focused on both the need to be really clear about people's needs, but also to manage those risks in ways that are, um, mean the budget won't be bust and that people are treated fairly over time. Do the councils have any projections as to what the take-up will be? This is absolutely something that um, we saw as a, as a risk when we carried out the work. Um, we certainly saw some of the areas that were slightly slower off the mark, if you like. Um, one of the issues was about uncertainty about what options people might choose. I mean, this is a big change, so there was a lack of clarity about how many people would opt for the services that they were getting anyway and how many would choose something different. And what we saw was, was quite a lot of work going in to support uh, frontline social work staff to have those conversations with people. Um, we've not yet mentioned that there are quite a number of examples in the report that I think try to bring to life what self-directed support will look like for people who, who need care and support services. And we found when we talked to staff who are involved at the front line that seeing those examples and sharing what's possible around self-directed support right through to the elected members actually get brought it to life, made people think that made people have a much better understanding about what was possible and what was achievable with self-directed support. So I think that will, will just take time as that spreads. And we heard from our case study councils that um, it wasn't necessarily something they expect people to make a single decision and then stick with. Mm -hmm. That it might be a sort of snowballing, a growing as people realise more what's possible with some of the options of self-directed support. So it's quite hard to make a prediction when people might come back in the review and change their mind and try something different and learn from other people they know and try other things. Clearly it's early days and uh, I think we've just got to wait and see how this develops. Thank you. Ms Crawford. Um, thanks, Convener. This is an interesting time to go into this, just so soon after the Act's passed. Um, and certainly as a parliamentarian, I'm finding this incredibly valuable because you've given us a good a starting point, a foundation. So when we go back and later to look at this again, we'll know where we came from. So it's incredibly valuable from that point. Now, the focus has been so far on what the councils are doing. I want to flip that back now to what the government's doing because it's quite clear in terms of your under option two uh, that you've described, which is you know asking others to arrange the chosen support that they have, that there are issues as far as councils are concerned in there in terms of the guidance they've got to deliver. Uh, and in paragraph 31, you describe how there is a risk that some councils may interpret the rules and regulations so cautiously that they might limit the choice and control people have over their own support. Um, and if we're going to move on from that low starting point, and that's why the Act's here, um, of 3%, three, three that's going to be quite an important area. Um, and you're obviously asking the government to develop that guidance. Can you give us a flavour of what you think that guidance might look like to help them, to help push this on a bit? Our, our view at this point is that the government has done a good job in um, consulting and involving the people affected by this in developing the guidance. Um, the effect of that was that it came out a bit later than some people might have liked, but our sense is that it is robust and, and well worked through because of the time taken. And that the £42 million of transitional funding um, has been targeted well towards both councils and to the third and voluntary sector and carers to help them um, understand what it means for them as well and engage in that. What we know, though, or what we expect, is that there will be some areas that are particularly tricky for individual councils or for all councils. We were talking just now with Mr Beattie about the potential implications of the different ways of allocating resources. Now, there will be some, some people who do that very well, um, and there will be opportunities, I think, to spread that good practice in line with the discussion you were having earlier with Douglas Sinclair about councils. There will be some councils who are struggling with it, either because they've got particular challenges in their area or because they haven't tapped into the network of um, support and expertise that may exist elsewhere. So we think there's that, that role, first of all, of simply monitoring progress and identifying where there might be room to, to spread expertise and experience. And there may be areas also where the guidance itself needs to be refined or tightened or refreshed as the policy rolls out and people find new and better ways of delivering what this is all about. Were there any specific areas in there, Cathy or Claire, that you wanted to highlight on top of that? Yes, I think because option two is, is so new, it is expected to be something that, um, you know, as councils learn, they will share, the guidance will get better, it's more of a, an evolutionary uh, process. Um, 
the, the issues that were raised with us by case studies that, um, were some of the very practical things and contractual things around relationships with providers who might manage somebody's budget on their behalf or, or administer their budget on their behalf. Um, and that may involve not simply providing services and taking money out of the budget, it may be using that budget to buy services from other providers. And so there are various complex relationships involved in that. And councils retain the uh, responsibility for making sure that people get the right care and also for the good use of public money. And so they, they uh, need to have, keep an eye on how that, that works and make sure that it, it, everything works properly. So until some of these things are tried, uh, it's, it's hard for them to set out guidance that would be very clear for councils uh, without perhaps limiting some of the options that people haven't yet thought about. How soon do you think government need to produce this guidance to allow things to, to move on? It's likely to be a continuing process. Um, okay. As Cathy said, people are um, developing this in different ways in response to different local circumstances. That's a good thing. Um, but keeping a close eye on it and looking at where there are either particularly good examples that should be spread or particular problems that weren't foreseen, being flexible and responsive to that, I think, is important. What you're really saying is let's, let, this needs to bed in a little bit more time to see where councils are actually developing the best practice so the government can use that then to provide the guidance to help others to get to where they need to be. Yeah, well we, Is that basically where We tried to draw out what we saw was, was a lot of effort going in to have a, a community and sharing good practice and, and uh, a real emphasis on partnership working between the Scottish Government, the local authorities, the voluntary private sector and people who need care and support uh, to try and work together to think about what was possible under self-directed support and where that might go in future. It, it was a good strong partnership arrangement. There was an issue about um, some areas feeling that guidance was coming out too late for them but actually that was sent out in draft and there was, was real consultation around what the implications might be behind that guidance so we saw that as a good thing. Thank you very much. Alan Keir. Uh, it's convenient. Um, a couple of questions. Um, first thing is in relation to the case study on page 24 and the second paragraph where uh, you say there's been some tensions between the council and providers who feel that they were not fully involved in developing strategy. And um, I'd like to know a wee bit more what, was, what were the actual problems that were found in this instance and uh, have there been similar instances across councils across the country? pick up the specifics of Edinburgh in a moment, um, maybe kick off by saying that in a sense it's not surprising that those tensions would arise, um, that what councils are required to do is to work with a range of um, private and voluntary sector providers as well as their own in-house services to talk about changes that might um, be quite far-reaching in terms of the sort of services needed and the way they're provided. Um, and they are both trying to, to build the partnership that Claire's been talking about to do that and to have to recognise that some of those uh, providers of services will be in competition with each other in due course. So the, the tensions themselves aren't unexpected. It does really place a premium on, on managing them well and being clear what's up for discussion and what's not. Claire or Cathy, can you pick up the specifics from that case study? Um, yes, in this one uh, we know that the, the council had developed a draft strategy and then shared that widely with providers and there was a lot of consultation at that point. So it felt like a document that perhaps had not been developed in partnership at that point. However, that was a consultation draft and the engagement began from there. So what we say in the case study is what providers reported to us about having felt that they hadn't had a say. Um, but there is an iterative process in that the final uh, strategy is expected to take on board some of the uh, comments the providers have raised since the draft one was issued. Has this found to be um, the thing that had in the back of my mind anyway was the council coming along saying this is the service we want and a provider basically saying well actually there's a better way of doing this and this is where the problems were starting or is my assumption wrong? feeling was in the early stages of development. However, the providers did report to us um, that they are feeling much more involved and that Council is trying very hard to involve them and listen to them and take on board some of the new things that they bring to the table. Um, so it's a, it's a relatively positive example that we've included in the report. Um, in paragraph 53, you talk about the developing the strategies in the areas, but the thing that really... I caught on to a little bit was really the, the last sentence, the risk is also greater 
for specialised types of services which relatively few people need, such as care of people with Huntington's disease, neurological illnesses and acquired brain injuries. Now, obviously, this is a, a bit of a sensitive area as well, and um, we can't have people falling through the gaps. So what, how, how do you find that um, councils are looking at these problems across the country? And is, do we have a problem here that hasn't been identified apart from in your report, or has it been identified out there and are actions in place to close these gaps? Right, I think what we saw um, in our case study examples was some good, in, good, good examples of practices in remote and rural communities where some of the options just haven't been there historically and some quite innovative ways of thinking about, right, how do we best meet the needs of the local community? So we've got some examples in the report about uh, working with business and social enterprise communities to try and develop things that haven't been there before. But in essence, um, I think the, the question you've asked is getting at um, their planning and commissioning arrangements. Uh, so that's absolutely something we've highlighted in previous reports on commissioning social care care for older people um, and I'm, I'm sure will be an issue that, that comes up again in terms of the new partnership arrangements between health and social care services about the need for local authorities, health boards, voluntary private sector to work together with people who need support to think about making, making sure that they get the support they need and that nobody does fall through those gaps, that there is clarity, that everybody does have access to the services that they require. So if it comes down to the likes of signposting people when they're coming to the point where they have to decide which way they're going to um, go forward with self-directed support in the purest sense or they want to stay with the local authority. Are we clear that the local authorities, uh, in terms of signposting people to what the options are in terms of their own uh, difficulties, that these signposting arrangements are in place? The stage we, we have looked at with this report means that we saw that in some places, we didn't see that in all areas of Scotland. It is a big focus in terms of implementing self-directed support has been an acknowledgement that for, for some particular groups of people uh, who are less familiar with a personalised service, so for example traditionally older people have had less take up of some of these options, um, that actually there is a job to be done about making sure that people are very, very clear about what options are available to them and are able to take a, a full part in, in, in the open conversation about what options they might want to pursue in future. Um, I think highlighting what self-directed support actually means in practice has been a, a, a learning process throughout the system for the people who need to access support, for their carers, for the people providing it, and for, for, for local authorities as well. Um, so I think that's just a journey that they're still on at the moment. But there's been a lot of focus, a lot of attention on the need to, to improve the information that people have in terms of what's possible. I suppose it takes us back to one of the first questions that was asked, that do people understand what self-directed support is? OK, thank you. OK, hey, thank you. And I uh, can I thank the Auditor General and her staff for uh, their input to the, the meeting in this issue. Thank you very much. Um, item 4, Section 22 report, the 2012-13 audit of North <coughs> Glasgow College. Um, committee members have a written submission from Glasgow Kelvin College um, and the Auditor General regarding uh, the report. Do members have any comments on either of those submissions? Uh, I, 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 Mary Scanlon. Um, I, I was surprised that uh, we have to wait an, three months, another three months, for uh, uh, you know for them to complete the task and to um, looking at the remuneration committee of that board. And my, I think it was also the point to make about restating their commitment to the highest standards of corporate governance. Well, if they, they are adhering to the highest standards of corporate governance, you know, why, aren't, why do we have to wait three months for a report? All we want is an audit trail and a minute of what happened. It just seems, seems an awful long time, given that we wrote to them in May. I think one of the issues is that um, we've got a, a new college looking back at the... Um, issues of a, a predecessor college and, and there is therefore not necessarily complete continuity. Um, I, I think the issue should be will they do the, the work thoroughly, uh, will they investigate it properly 
Um, and uh, obviously, if we get a, a thorough report, that will um, influence um, what we decide to do. Uh, any comment? Any other members of comments on either the submission from Glasgow Kelvin or indeed from the Auditor General, who's given us information on the, the names of the members of the Remuneration Committee? No. Sorry, so, Tavi Scott. Back at what stage? When exactly will we see this back to us? Or maybe an unfair question, but. Is it going to be October? It depends. It could be October, depending yeah. when we get the response from, from the college. Um, I think, you know, if, if members um, reflect, we have a, a kind of strange timetable for the next three to four months. So um, it could well be after the October recess, but it's, it's dependent on the college. Okay, okay so agree to note in the meantime. Yeah. Thank you. Um, item 5, Section 23 report, uh, Scotland's Colleges 2013. Um, members have a written submission from the Scottish Government um, about this. Any comments on the response from the Scottish Government? The AGS will be producing an annual report on Scotland's colleges in February 2015. So <coughs> I think we could agree to note and return to it at that time. Thank you. <coughs> uh, item 6, Section 23 report, Modern Apprenticeships. You have a written submission from Skill Development Scotland. Any comments on that? Nadia Scanlon. Sorry to be the awkward one again. I, I was actually a bit disappointed in the, the response that we got from Skills Development Scotland. It was quite a significant part of the report about the uh, the modern apprenticeship programme and the priorities and you know uh, aligning the modern apprenticeship with the priorities of government. And it was a, a point that the cabinet secretary uh, responded to very very well. And um, and, and Robert Scotland said there was insufficient information on uh, the priorities. And what we get from uh, Skills Development Scotland is um, SDS's role in modern apprenticeships is primarily to administer the funding for training on behalf of the government and ensure the government's priorities are met. Well, that, I don't think that's enough. Uh, and I certainly am not impressed. They haven't given us any idea... Uh, you know, when this programme priority, what they kept they kept telling us was demand-led, they've given us no idea when this will be completed. And, and I think we'd be failing in our duty on this committee if we didn't, you know, ask them for a bit more information and rather than being fobbed off with a simple sentence like this. Um, I, I think that they should be doing what the government expect them to do. I think they should be doing what Audit Scotland also expect them to do. And I think this one sentence is not good enough. So uh, I was disappointed in that. OK, any other comments? Have they answered what we asked them? Not entirely. Um, you know, for example, um, we'd asked them about the objectives of the modern apprenticeship programme and the relative priority of each objective. We, don't, we haven't been given a great deal of information on what the priorities are, um, and I think that would be helpful. Um, you know, we'd need more clarification on that. Um, and the other issue about um, what work is SDS under, uh, what work is SDS undertaking with the Scottish Government to develop outcome measures to assess the long-term benefits of modern apprenticeships? Well, that's been going on for some time. But there's no indication of when that's going to be completed. So, and that was asked in the letter as well. Well, I, I think it would be helpful if they would tell us um, when when that could be completed. Tavi Scott. Yeah, I apologise for missing the, the first session on this. I'm a bit uh, a bit uh, off the pace on this one. But um, if their role is just to administer a scheme, then that raises a fundamental question about that could be done in a different way, rather more effectively. All the feedback I get from my part of the world is that they are a top-down bureaucratic organisation 
uh, who do not add value to a really good programme which is delivering as many modern apprenticeships as we want right across Scotland. And I think there are better ways to do this, but this is probably not the occasion in which to... Uh, uh, to raise this, but I'm with Mary. I think the the fairly woeful answer in that in response to that uh, objectives thing. If they're just an administrator, then then frankly, I think there's better ways to do this with and achieve an awful lot more for public money in the ways in which we want. Yes, Carla. I'm sorry, I apologise. Um, not only did they not answer the first question, didn't answer the third one, and that was significant in evidence. Um, who is responsible for acting on and reporting concerns about training provider performance? Now, I actually brought along the Audit Committee report because on page 34, Audit Scotland said there's no equivalent independent reviews of the quality of training provided by private, well, other providers, including private training providers, and there are concerns about apprenticeship uh, assessments, uh, and I think they sort of chose to, to bypass that as well. So I, I'm not impressed at the... I don't think we've got the information that we asked for. It certainly doesn't take us any further forward uh, in terms of uh, modern apprenticeships. OK, could, could we agree to seek further information now? Some of it may well come from SDS, some of it we can write to the accountable officer and the Scottish Government, but I think um, we probably need more information um, on what the priorities are yeah. and clarification uh, on that. And if we could also ask, um, when, will the, when will the work on developing the outcome measures on the long-term benefits actually be completed? And also Great. the performance of the training provider oh, sorry, performance. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I was right, but, but I think can we set this in context as well because it was one of the most positive reports we'd actually seen from the other general about the performance of Skills Development Scotland. So as long as we're recognising the context. Yeah. No. We're, we're simply writing, asking for the clarification that you know there's no other comments that will be associated uh, at this stage with that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, Item 7, um, Section 23 report, managing early departures from the Scottish public sector. You have written submissions from the Scottish Government um, on the, the Joint Auditor General and Accounts Commission report. Any comments? Yeah. Ken McIntosh. Yes, yeah, I had a number of observations to make here, uh, which I do welcome clarification on. Um, the first would be about confidentiality clauses. Uh, clearly, there's a particular issue about the use of confidentiality clauses and, or the increase, the, the growing use of confidentiality clauses in recent years uh, by this government, particularly in the NHS, which uh, the Cabinet Secretary has finally acted upon to, to stop the increased use. However, it only applies to the NHS, but confidentiality clauses are used throughout the public sector. There was uh, compromise agreements, just to give you some figures, uh, the police used a, had about 20, 203 compromise agreements at a cost of more than £2 million pounds since, this is since 2007. Uh, Scottish Government directorate, directorates, so this is Scottish Government itself, had 173 such arrangements at a cost of over £3.5 million. Pounds. Local authorities had more than 10,000 at a cost of £32 million. Um, so I, I'd be interested to know whether the Government intend to apply the rules about confidentiality clauses to these bodies, or is it simply to the NHS itself? Also, the, the, the list of bodies at the, at the back of this letter, which are covered by the revised reporting arrangements, they include, for example, um, the police authority in Scottish Prime Minister. They don't include Police Scotland itself. They don't seem to include the universities, who have been widespread users of these clauses, and they don't include the Scottish Government directly itself either, the, the direct um, agencies. And um, there's a final issue, if I may, within the guidance itself, which is about um, the difference between voluntary resignation secured by a financial consideration and a settlement arrangement. So just uh, page three, um, paragraph one, the proposed process is as follows. And if you just look at the, the bit that's in brackets and in italics, so NB, these materials may also be used to submit cases for voluntary resignation secured by a financial consideration. So you're paying somebody off to retire. However, the reporting arrangements do not apply to a voluntary resignation. And when you go on later on, um, paragraph 7, page 4, uh, it says that voluntary resignations that are, have a financial consideration must be approved 
but it doesn't look like, and I do want to be clear from this, it does not look as if they have to be reported by. In the next paragraph, it, it says that they only should be uh, reported to the Parliament as required. Now, so what I don't understand is settlement agreements now have to be reported to us. Voluntary resignations with a payoff don't seem to be. It strikes me that that's a bit odd, to put it mildly. Um, so I just, I just like further clarification of all three points, if that's possible. Um, Comments? Um, <clears throat> you'll note on, on sorry, just just before um, on page five, um, the, it does say the presumption against inclusion of confidentiality clauses in settlement agreements also applies to other public bodies. And to this end, we will develop in consultation with public bodies a draft operational confidentiality. Confidential, confidentiality clause which would be only inserted at the request of either party uh, and then explicitly agreed with both parties. So, so, the point yeah, is that uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary issued guidance about this last year. It yeah. wasn't followed. Every single compromise, every single one, I think maybe possibly with the exception of one, um, had a confidentiality clause included. So clearly it takes quite robust interventions, I would suggest, if we're actually going to end this practice. And this is not a new, this is a growing practice. This isn't something that's, I mean, people talk about this as if it's been around historically for ages. It's always been around, but the point is the use of it has grown and grown remarkably in recent years. And I think it'll take explicit action in each of these sectors to stop it. We've seen it in the NHS now, and there's been a petition of this parliament uh, which highlighted its misuse. But I think it'll take more than just suggesting there's a presumption against the inclusion of confidential articles. That's not right. working so okay. far. Bruce Crawford. Well, well, I, I, I can understand where comes, Ken's coming from in some of this, but you know there are some organisations out there, the way they're incorporated, the way they're organised, such as the universities, where we, the, the, there is no mechanism for the Scottish Government to enforce that without primary legislation, because that's there are different types of bodies. They are not part of the public sector. They don't consider themselves that. So I just, just in terms of context, uh, and in paragraph 7, I understand where Ken's coming from, but do we really want to know about voluntary resignations of an employee who are out with the schemes as a parliament? I'm not sure I want to know that, because that's just a normal voluntary process. I, I would want to know about voluntary resignations with a payoff. Yeah, but that's not what I was saying here. It's saying that the voluntary resignations of an employee out with any existing scheme, as in paragraph 7, must be approved by the head of department and the Scottish Finance Department. I don't think we need to know about that as a parliament. That's the point I'm making. Uh, well, I mean, just, just further on here, uh, the, what, what the government is saying, that the number of settlement agreements entered into across the Scottish administration, the questions involved, the Scottish government will not disclose the terms of circumstances. That's fine. But they'll only do the voluntary, the voluntary resignations with costs as required. As required by whom? Do we have to... Okay. It's very... At that point, clearly yeah. That point if, you, if you don't know what's going on, how do you know to, to, yeah. to ask? Well, can, can we seek clarification on, 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 those part, uh, on those points and then we can come back uh, to committee with the response? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and with that, we come to private session, uh, item eight. The committee moves into private. We'll take, take, a, take a break for a few minutes.